Okay, so I'll, I'll kick off, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Colleagues, friends, distinguished ambassadors, and our honored guests from the European Union. My name is Michael Mayo, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Foundation for Jewish Heritage. On behalf of the Foundation and our esteemed consortium colleagues, the European Jewish Cemeteries Initiative and Centropa, we are delighted to welcome you to the concluding event of this unique Jewish Cemeteries Preservation Initiative, which is a co-funded project of the European Union. We have been on an astonishing journey these past 18 months. We have learned so much more about the situation of the Jewish cemeteries of Eastern Europe, the absent presence of Jewish life in so many of these places, and to look at how Jewish cemeteries and Jewish heritage can play a special role in the Europe of today. This is what we're going to explore over the next few hours. You're going to learn about a whole range of activities that involved many hundreds of people across the seven countries that were the focus of this project. As you learn about what was done, I hope you will find this more than just interesting, that you will feel inspired, because we don't want this event to represent a finishing of something, but more a call to action. You all have copies of the programme, and I'll be introducing the speakers, although because of the limited time, I will not be making lengthy introductions. Sophie Pownell of ESGF, mm -hmm. who you will meet shortly, will be assisting me. Please put any questions into the chat and we will endeavor to answer them. And there will be a way of raising comments or questions after the event, which we will notify you of. We'll begin with some introductory remarks from the consortium partners. So I'll now invite Phil Carmel, Chief Executive of the European Jewish Cemeteries Initiative to say some words. Over to you, Phil. Thank you, Michael, and welcome to all the participants at this event. And a particular thanks to our partners in the European Commission who have backed us for many years now in this project at the preservation of Jewish cemeteries. The SGF was set up in 2015 with the principal aim to protect Jewish cemeteries in Europe. We are not de facto a preservation organization, but we recognize after fencing 275 sites in 10 European countries and continuing on this work that we will never be able to complete our task or even to protect the cemeteries which we've started to protect without the involvement of local people. The key element of this project is for Europeans at the national, international and local level to take on board Jew Jewish heritage and the memory of the Shoah as part of their own local heritage. It is in a sense ownership, it's ownership and it's also duty and responsibility. It's a responsibility of care to those Jewish communities who no longer exist in the thousands of sites and communities across Central and Eastern Europe. We know that about 9,000 Jewish cemeteries exist in those areas. We have physically surveyed over 4,000 of them with the support of the European Commission. And we need desperately to continue that work. And I hope at the end of this project, we will continue with that work and to continue the protection. But without the mobilization of young people, without the mobilization of local communities and activists, we cannot continue with this work. And that's why it's been an absolute ple pleasure and a great importance to be able to work with educational and cultural organizations and partners like Centropa and like the Foundation of the Jewish Heritage. And I wanna put on record my deep thanks on behalf of our own organization for all that work that we've done over those years. I also want to make an important point here as well. The SJF is a Kiev based organization. Many of our partners, and particularly our staff, have worked to continue this process 
even jaw awing an invasion. And we salute all those people and we hope and pray for their safety as well, that they can continue in this incredibly important work. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you, Phil, for those, those comments. I will now ask Ed Sorota, founding director of Centropa, to say some words. Over to you, Ed. <clears throat> thank you, Michael. Um, uh, Centropa was asked to participate uh, in this program, and when we were, I was thrilled to do so. Most of the hard work uh, has been done by our team, uh, led by uh, Fabian Ruler, who runs Centropa in Germany, uh, and his team. Basically, uh, I've been working in this part of the world since 1985, uh, visiting cemeteries, synagogues, Jewish communities uh, for a, a very long time, obviously. Uh, we, Centropa was founded in 2000. We began an education in 2005. Most of what we do is Holocaust education in the lands where the Holocaust took place. Uh, and we have a, a variety of content that we have created based on this. Many of the cities we work in, there are no Jews, there are no synagogues, but in uh, thousands of them, there are cemeteries and there are public schools. And when we started working with our public schools and came up with the idea of using cemeteries basically as an outdoor classroom, our team led by Fabian, also by uh, Maria Lieberman in our Budapest office, jumped on the project because this was a way to involve students and teenagers to explore their cemeteries and explore their town's Jewish heritage. To my knowledge, I don't know of another project that's actually done this in this way. We couldn't do any of this, by the way, without the uh, support and the partnership uh, from the uh, uh, from Michael Mayo's organization, foundation, and also from ESJF itself. It's a partnership that actually works. Uh, and we're very glad to be part of it. And I'll go into some details about the remarkable work that teachers are doing in Ukraine. And I know my colleague Fabian will be talking about the work that his team is doing too. Thanks for having me on. Oh, that's terrific. Ed, thank you very much for those comments. Uh, Dame Helen Hyde is the chair of the Foundation for Jewish Heritage and she will now add her remarks. Hey, you're on mute. Thank you, Michael. As a, a teacher and a former long-standing head of a major secondary school, I'm delighted to be with you all today. As Michael said, I'm the chair of the Foundation for Jewish Heritage, working closely with Michael, who is our founder and chief executive. The foundation was established to work internationally on the preservation of Jewish heritage at risk. Our mantra is preserving the past, shaping the future. I know you are all, of course, aware of the special challenges that Jewish heritage faces as a result of the great upheavals of the 20th century and the tragedy of the Holocaust. This resulted in many historical Jewish sites losing their community of users, abandoned and neglected. To, th to this day, many important Jewish sites remain in danger in various regions of Europe. The foundation seeks to preserve Jewish heritage through research, providing expertise, as well as advocacy. We work with local par partners to find local solutions for these beautiful buildings and sites. We look for new purposes that bring them back to use while also commemorating and celebrating the Jewish communities these buildings once served. The foundation commissioned unprecedented unpre research to map 3,347 synagogues in Europe in order to identify the most important synagogues in danger. Our role is primarily educational, using these remarkable buildings to inform about the life and contribution of the Jewish community, Jewish culture and values, building awareness, understanding and empathy, combating ignorance, prejudice and anti-Semitism. Our role in the Jewish Cemeteries Project, we have worked closely with our great consortium partners in Centropa and ESJF to develop educational and cultural projects linked to the Jewish cemeteries and the Jewish narrative. We have co-run teacher training seminars 
promoting the notion of Jewish cemeteries as outdoor uh, classrooms. We've held webinars for the tourism industry to demonstrate the value of cemeteries as visitor destinations. We've produced two important research reports, one on the educational potential of Jewish cemeteries by, Doc, by Professor Joanna Mecklick, and the second on the tourism potential of these cemeteries by Dr. Paul Darby. Dr. Rachel Lichtenstein coordinated the Deep Dive Program, running innovative and educational activities in the Jewish cemeteries in each of the seven project countries that serve as case studies and models. We've learned a great deal working together. We've learned of the significance of Jewish cemeteries as part of the joint European heritage, their parlous state and the need for their protection. And we've learned about the huge potential of Jewish cemeteries as an important resource supporting European values of human rights, the recognition of diversity and democracy. Michael and I have enjoyed working with our impressive consortium partners, and we are very grateful to the EU for supporting this very important work. Thank you, Michael. That's great. And thank you, Helen, and thank you again, Ed, Ed and Phil, for these introductory remarks. Uh, we're now going to move on, and this next presentation is titled the European Union and Jewish cemeteries are a shared heritage, and this will be given by someone who's become widely recognized and respected as a leader and champion in her field, Katharina von Schnurbein, the European Commission Coordinator on Combating Antisemitism and Fostering Jewish Life. So Katharina, if I can invite you to say some words. Yes, hello, I'm just starting the video. Let's see. Yeah, here we are. So, hi, Michael, um, Phil, Ed, you'll see many, many uh, faces. Uh, it's great to, uh, to see you, uh, Helen, as well. And uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to, to be with you. I, before I go into the more official um, presentation, I just want to um, tell you a secret um, about and a personal remark, which is really that I love Jewish cemeteries. <laughs> and when I studied in Prague in the 90s, I used to have to go by train from my parents' home in the Bavarian forest through the Bohemian forest, the Shumava. Um, and whenever I passed there, I saw at a, at a certain place a cemetery to the to the left, uh, and it was clear it was a Jewish uh, cemetery. It was abandoned, and uh, and so when I drove past by car once, I looked for it and I found it. It's in Schlihof, uh, which used to have a very sizable uh, Jewish community in the as of the seventh century, and it had beautiful um, headstones, Baroque uh, Renaissance. And when I saw it in the uh, in the nineties. It was quite um, abandoned, high grass and so on. And now I passed by it today, uh, again uh, in um, October of 2022, and I saw that it's actually fenced. It has a it has a very nice stone wall. It seems to be kept in order. It seems that the local people are, as as Phil also said, are taking care of ensuring that it's um, uh, that it is. Um, being kept in uh, also open for visitors. And I was very pleased to read um, at the sign that it was supported by EU funding, this, uh, this uh, fencing with a very nice wall. In fact, if you allow me, I will quickly um, show you the picture. I'll share my screen if, that's, if that doesn't take too much time. Sure, sure. Can you see it? No. no. Sophie, I don't know. Host disabled. OK, I cannot share my screen. I just it. you should be able to do it now. Yeah, try, try it again, Katrina. Let's see. Let's try it. You see it now? Mm. No, share not, screen again. We're not, we're not okay. seeing it. You know, sadly, we're not. 
No, okay. Never mind. Not, uh, um, so anyway, it was it was good to see and uh, and I like coming back to this. Um, now it has also very nice uh, a gate and um, and it says, however, also something about um, the fact that on the other side of the road there is a so-called new cemetery, which was which was created in the 19th century, and large parts of that cemetery are empty because those who were supposed to be buried there were instead transported to Theresienstadt and then on to Auschwitz, and the last Jews of Schwiehoff left um, between the 26th and the 30th of November in 1942. So with the cemeteries and with uh, the heritage that uh, we see there comes a whole story of uh, Jewish life, of Jewish um, of, of the way Jews and, uh, and uh, Christians lived together in these places, how they enriched um, the, the local um, uh, culture and how also through schools and through uh, creating networks, uh, they, they really um, were part of the, of the Shumaba of this, um, of this Bohemian forest. And I think this is really something that cannot be overestimated in uh, the uh, ESJF uh, project. How with, uh, with paying respect um, and with fencing these uh, cemeteries, you, um, you safeguard also the memory and, uh, and the, the heritage that comes with it. So the, the Jewish life um, that was uh, there and of which these uh, cemeteries uh, speak. Very fascinating. Um, in the last years, we've seen, and I think that people understand the symbolism of uh, of the cemeteries because we see and we have seen vandalism of Jewish cemeteries um, from France to Germany, Poland, Greece, uh, Romania. Um, they are an expression of uh, anti-Semitic feelings. Uh, they violate the sacrality of Jewish holy places. And of course, they hurt uh, Jewish uh, communities. So uh, the, the two aspects um, uh, go together. We need to recognize that uh, vandalism of uh, Jewish cemeteries, even if it's like in Eastern France was the case, it's, um, and you know, just because it's an abandoned place, um, young people did not recognize um, the significance, maybe they still need to understand uh, what it is. And so I think we need to make sure that uh, with, with your project, this educational aspect is very much uh, strengthened and, uh, and also again shows not only the um, cemetery as such, but the Jewish culture and heritage that goes uh, with it. A lot of um, orphaned heritage, and we've talked about this uh, with several of you in, uh, in the, the, at different occasions, um, is often in poor conditions um, and at the danger of deterioration. And I think it is really uh, to our generation to make sure uh, that uh, this heritage is uh, kept and that it is um, also embraced by the local community. And I think uh, maybe uh, if it doesn't sound too spiritual, but there is a, a healing process that also can be part of uh, ensuring that, um, uh, that cemeteries and beyond that other orphaned heritage is being revived. Or yeah. It sounds a bit strange for a cemetery, I guess, but um, it is it's just something that uh, that uh, can be uh, accessible. In the EU strategy on combating anti-Semitism and fostering Jewish life, um, we call on the member states to support uh, the European Heritage Days by highlighting uh, Jewish heritage in the national context and also by supporting the maintenance and safeguarding of Jewish heritage and um, we have, uh, as you know, also made uh, funding available to safeguard Jewish heritage, uh, including uh, the cemeteries. Um, and, and what 
from my side, um, I really want to support this also to make sure that we can continue to use also EU funds for the uh, face, uh, facing, uh, fencing and safeguarding of the cemeteries. I really commend uh, the project um, that you have uh, that you have uh, successfully now concluded for raising awareness uh, in local communities and for implementing these educational projects for calling for the integration of the Jewish cemeteries into um, the local heritage as part of it and then also making it part of curriculum. I think that um, the the local aspect for school children is something they, um, they will never forget and will also give them when it comes to anti-Semitism a certain resilience. And that's a very important uh, aspect to this. Um, the, the motto protect, educate and respect, uh, I think uh, is an important uh, one that uh, hopefully will continue beyond uh, also the, the project in itself. We often say that uh, to shape Europe's future, people need to understand the past. And I think it's uh, very true in particular in uh, the context of Jewish life. And while we know that the knowledge about Jewish life is very low um, and Jewish traditions, um, in fact, uh, according to our survey, only 3% of Europeans say that they feel they know Jewish traditions and culture uh, very well. Uh, it is all the more important uh, to ensure that there is um, a, a transmission of, uh, of knowledge, including also then um, the responsibility that non-Jews take for their local uh, Jewish heritage. And I've met a few and I, I think they are really also enriched by connecting um, with the past in, in that way. What we will do also in, um, in continuation is to call on local authorities um, to acknowledge the educational and cultural value of uh, the sites and to encourage them to support uh, the projects, including also um, teacher training institutions and um, the Jewish cemeteries and, and classroom guide uh, and use that really as a practical uh, tool to make sure that um, your work will, um, will continue to help young people in their discovery of Jewish uh, heritage and that it's not just a guide that is but really something that will be used uh, very actively um, in, uh, in school curricula. I thank you very much for, for having me. I'll, um, I won't be able to stay the whole afternoon, but it's something that uh, is very dear to my heart. And I hope that we will find ways to ensure that the project uh, can uh, continue. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Katerina. And I think you know, I can speak for everyone who's in on this, uh, this event that we know uh, how grateful we, we all feel towards the EU and the European Commission for the support uh, that has been forthcoming. And uh, it's terrific that you know, we know that this is a, a long-term commitment that the EU is making, and that's partly reflected in, in, in your position uh, within the European Commission. Uh, so we're, you know, we have, it's been a pleasure working with you in the past, and we look forward to that continuing into the future. I'm now going to call upon Dr. Yossi Balin, who is a board member of the European Jewish Cemeteries Initiative and a former Minister of Justice of the State of Israel, and Sophie Pownall, Project Manager of ESGF, to give a general overview of the project. Well, if, if I may uh, talk, <clears throat> Actually, when we began the project eight years ago, I must admit that at least I was not sure about the targets. For some of us, uh, they were religious targets, just to preserve the, the 
uh, the corpses of, uh, of Jews. This was a religious aim, sacred aim. For others, like myself, I presume also for Phil Carmel, it was more cultural to uh, assure that uh, the Jewish uh, culture, which uh, was formed uh, and developed in, in Europe, uh, would prevail. After eight years, we are in a very different uh, situation. Actually, if I may speak for myself, I wasn't aware of the ignorance of the young generation in Europe about the existence of Jews and their contribution before the Second World War. I could understand it intellectually until I, I first saw it. You know, there are people whom we meet and never met Jews before, never were aware of the fact that in, in their townships, Jews lived and were even the majority in those little places in Eastern Europe. In Minsk, there was a Jewish majority before the First World War for a while. And people don't know about Jews today. And it, it reminded me all the time, the movie which was uh, produced in, in, the, in the 20s, 100 years ago, about uh, Vienna without Jews, a uh, fiction, fiction, <laughs> uh, Vienna without Jews expelled by the non-Jews, and then they are calling the Jews to come back because Vienna cannot operate. Now, the, the physicians, the doctors in Vienna were Jews. There was a big Jewish majority of doctors in Vienna, not to speak about the malas, the, the of the world, the musicians and the, the artists and 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 the, the authors, uh, whatever. I mean, the the elite of the of the uh, European uh, uh, culture uh, was made of Jews. Now, I I'm asking myself all the time: how how can we tell the people something like that? It is not just to make justice for people who were killed in a crazy way during the Holocaust years. These are people without whom so many things in Europe would have never happened, never. And the, the cemeteries are a, a poor, but the only memory that we have with names of, of people, something about what did they, they what what have they done in, in in life and whatever. So the the issue of cemeteries became a much more a much different much more different message that people who live in Europe today, the young generation, would be aware of what happened there, but more so about what have they missed. And uh, when we, we were working uh, on that with our wonderful partners, really, and with the help of the German government and the European Union, and Katerina is here, and, and uh, you are really wonderful, almost unbelievable, in your dedication to, to, this, uh, uh, to these projects. I think that we began to scratch the, the issue, the problem, and to see what can really be done. I mean, the, it became from saving Jewish cemeteries to a, a very interesting educational and cultural project. The connection with elementary schools, kids who never saw Jews before us, to the universities, the, the faculty and the students with whom we, we worked on seminars and on lectures and other things, and they became part of this project. This, this is what it became now. Now, with the European Union help, what 
as a field set before. We were successful in doing something which had never been done before. And that is counting the cemeteries, knowing in which situation they are and prioritize our work, which was very difficult before. We did prioritize, but now it became much more professional. We know which cemeteries among those whom we succeeded to count, the, about 4,000 of them are in danger of disappearing, vanishing in, in the a, a forest of Europe, of East Europe. It's not only the issue of, a, a, of, of a vandalism or anti-Semitism or whatever, it is in the margins. The main thing is nature and nature may cover many of those uh, uh, cemeteries. Now, we stopped in the middle and we, we appreciate that we, we assume that we are speaking about more 4,000 or 5,000 uh, more cemeteries. We are going to lose many of them if we are not able to prioritize. And this is why it is so important for us to continue the work of survey and to know it is not a big project, if I may say. It is something that it is doable in a year and year and a half, we can finish the work and know exactly how many uh, cemeteries are there on our way. Because if we don't do that and we cannot prioritize and we are missing some of them, we will not be able to reverse the course of things, never. So this is the, 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 last, the last years in which something like this can, can happen. And uh, I, I think that, uh, again, you cannot tell the European story of the last centuries without the Jewish story. And uh, we can be proud of the Jewish story. We, we can uh, be said about it and should be said about it. But the most important thing is to understand what was the part? Because even we in Israel, we don't know that many of the people whom we are quoting in literature or singing their, their songs or, or, or whatever are Jews, were Jews. So I, I would like really to thank the European Union uh, for its endeavors and, and especially you, Katharine. But uh, I, I would like also to, to raise the, the request to continue. Thank you. Yeah. I will thank you, Yossi, for that. I mean, it's actually your fascinating remarks. And Sophie, I believe you're now going to take us through a kind of overview of the types of activities that were run throughout the 18 months. So over to you, Sophie. Yeah, that's right. Are you able to see my screen? Uh, yes, yes, we can. Okay, lovely. Um, so like was said, I'm now going to do a quick overview into all the things that we've done in the past 18 months. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sophie. I am the project manager of the grant and I've been supporting um, all partners in the ESGF with the implementation of the project. Okay, so a little bit about us. Um, the Preserving Jewish Cemeteries project is an EU-funded project that has four main aims. To assess, review, deepen and synthesise our understanding of Jewish cemeteries as resources of cultural heritage that support socio-economic development, social dialogue, cohesion and a past-aware, forward-thinking um, society um, that have shared European values, especially tolerance and diversity. Yeah. We also... Yes. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Can you well still done. see my screen or has that stopped now? Can you still see my screen? Your screen is gone. No. We try again. <laughs> okay. No, yes, that's good. <laughs> Our second aim is to raise cross-sectoral awareness of the relevance of Jewish cemeteries, 
Um, third is to build sustainable engagement on the ground, ensuring that Jewish cemeteries are recognized, valued and included on the agenda of local and, and regional leadership, as well as by stakeholders in the tourism sector and educational professionals. Um, our final goal is to utilize and further disseminate the information that we gathered during our um, previous EU projects, because this is the third of our um, projects within this series of preserving Jewish cemeteries. We've been active in seven European countries, including Georgia, Hungary, Lithuania, Moldova, Poland, Slovakia, and Ukraine. And again, as you already know, um, the project has been implemented by three partners, the ESJF Centropa and the Foundation for Jewish Heritage. In our two previous grants, our main focus was surveying and mapping over 4,000 Jewish cemeteries across um, the project countries using cutting edge drone technology. With this, we created an open access database, the first of its kind of European Jewish cemeteries. Um, and this includes maps, images, and historical overviews of each cemetery that we visited. This work was complemented by educational work and the creation of uh, publications and is the foundations of the knowledge and methods we've used during this current project. Over the past months, we've been very, very busy working with teachers, schools, engaged leaders. We've been hosting student competitions. We've done seven deep dive projects and we've created three more publications. By doing this, we've reached over 200 teachers, 300 engaged leaders who will act as multipliers, influencing many more in the future, including their students and networks. We also reached 400 students in our competitions and another at least 400 in our deep dive project. We're now going to have a little look uh, into what that actually meant. So the ESJF hosted masterclasses for engaged leaders in the project countries in order to share the knowledge and best practices on Jewish cemeteries that we've collected, and also in order to support the creation of networks of Jewish cemetery preservation activists, otherwise also called regional cemetery associations. The masterclasses concluded with a conference in Budapest for public authorities, where we heard from mayors such as the mayor of Perichin from Ukraine about the importance of preserving Jewish cemeteries, even in times of war. Centropa, on the other hand, held international seminars for teachers, showing them exactly how to integrate Jewish cemeteries into the school curriculum. And they started the model school projects where educators were directly supported in engaging students to do Jewish cemetery related arts and research projects. Um, the uh, Centropa and the Foundation for Jewish Heritage um, also hosted two conferences for teachers um, and teacher trainers tackling the overarching question um, of integrating Jewish cemeteries into educational systems. Throughout the project, we also held student competitions, which reached young people directly. In our international youth competition, students were invited to make short videos and presentation on their local Jewish cemetery. In the hackathon and the technology webinar, students took part in a challenge using UAV data. And in the photography competition, students captured pictures of Jewish cemeteries. The deep dive project took place in seven um, project countries um, in collaboration with the Foundation for Jewish Heritage and Centropa, led by Dr. Rachel Lichtenstein, who we'll hear from later today. A range of activities took place, including a digital audio guide, photo um, exhibition, heritage trails, um, and lots more activities, which we will again hear about later. I won't go into too much detail. Um, we also produced three new publications, building on the information that we gathered during our last grants. The research took place on the inclusion of Jewish cemeteries in the school curriculum, the need for resources and teacher training, the potential of Jewish cemeteries as tourist sites and suggestions for their development and the mapping of laws that impact the preservation of Jewish cemeteries. Seminars took place on each of these publications to promote their findings to the relevant stakeholder groups and to ensure that they will be used in the future. Um, so yeah, that was just a, a quick overview of everything that we've done. Um, and we're now going to hear from all the people who were involved in our project um, a little bit more about exactly what happened during all of these activities. Thank you very much.
Well, that's terrific. Sophie, thank you very much for that. It was very helpful just to, to see it presented in at that helicopter perspective. So we're now going to look uh, in, in more detail at some of the specific activities. And I'm delighted to introduce Fabian Ruhl, who is the director of Centropa Hamburg, and he has been the main person from Centropa leading the project. And he will be joined by Tiona Dalakishvili, who is Centropa's Georgia coordinator. And Tio has been the, the linchpin of the work that took place in Georgia across the 18 months. So we're going to look at uh, some specific activities. So I'll now hand over to Fabian and Tio. Thank you so much, Michael. And also thank you, I think Katarina von Schulman has left us, but I still want to thank her for her words earlier to everyone and, and uh, really appreciate, really uh, want to thank the European Commission for making this project possible. Um, I, I want to start my presentation with a quote that I'm going to put in the chat. And this quote was given by a Polish teacher who attended our training seminar. I'm going to read it out, but you can also read it uh, in the chat. A cemetery is the base for any work that can be done on Jewish history, because in my city, it is the only material object related to the history of the Jews, which survived and did not change its purpose. Um, so again, this was given by a teacher after she attended our training seminar in 2022 uh, in Poland. Um, and I think it really encapsulates the, encapsulates the power of Jewish cemeteries as an educational tool. And when we started uh, our cooperation with the European Jewish Cemetery Initiative a few years ago, um, we had uh, experimented and we had tried working uh, with Jewish cemeteries during our training seminars. Um, but over the last three years, uh, we've been able to, to uh, further, further gain insight and uh, some of the reports that, were, uh, that are shown later will also um, uh, show how and what we have learned in the, in the previous year, in, in, the, in the past years, working with the teachers, working with teacher trainers, and also inviting education ministry officials. Um, the it's working in seven countries can be challenging, but we were lucky enough that we had already partners on the ground that helped us a lot. So I want to thank them here also. Uh, for example, we had in Sovak in Banska Bystrica, we had the Museum of uh, Slovak National Uprising. In uh, Poland is the Galicia Jewish Museum in Krakow, who we, uh, which we've been working with since 2012. Uh, in, uh, in, in Hungary, we have an office, Central of Budapest office that has been working closely with the Jewish communities. In Georgia and Tbilisi, we've been working with uh, Theo, who will be presenting uh, shortly. Uh, um, she's uh, the head of uh, co-founder of the Creative Development Center there. Um, and I want to also specifically sing out some of the teachers that we've working with. And one person in particular, that's Andrei Koshernik, who is and an, has been our Ukrainian coordinator while serving in the army. So, so everything that we've been doing in Ukraine, which we will highlight later, has been uh, has been made possible thanks to Andre. We invite you to visit our project website, which was developed by Peter Bala in Hungary at www.jewishcemeteries.eu. Uh, in case you haven't seen it, we're going to put it in the chat also. Um, here you can find reports with graphs from our seminars, quotes from the teachers uh, that, that attended our training programs. We held seven training seminars in seven project countries for over 200 teachers, um, plus the one seminar in, in uh, one seminar held in cooperation with the uh, Euroclio organization in Bratislava, which was attended by another 35 teachers. So all together, we have trained in the past 18 months, 240 teachers, and uh, we have the data to show how this has impacted their work. But, and this is important, we did not only train and engage teachers, we also encouraged young Europeans in the seven project countries to become engaged in preserving Jewish history. How did we do that? We organized two cross-country competitions. In the first, we asked high school students to make their own short films on My Town Jewish Cemetery. The second competition, for that one, we invited university students to submit their artistic photos of a Jewish cemetery in their region. The winners were awarded gift vouchers, and you can witness some of these fabulous outputs today, as well as on our project website. Um, so I'm going to turn out over the floor now to one of our coordinators, Theo from Tbilisi, who's right now actually in, uh, in Sweden uh, at a conference. Theo, 
Thank you so much for joining us. And I think you are best equipped of uh, all of us here in this room to really show the uh, local impact that this project has uh, accomplished thanks to people like you. So thank you, Theo, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Fabian, and thanks everyone. First of all, it's uh, really um, um, amazing to speak next to you and to share the results that we have achieved. I hope you can see, see my screen. Um, as Fabian mentioned, I am in the Paideia now in Stockholm, and it was really amazing that so many people know about our project, and they are really amazed by the work that we are doing, and it's very familiar on the European level. And I was yesterday telling the story, kind of my Jewish story, and uh, it's very important to also share it here, because like what I do now with Centropa is something that I was dreaming to do for a very long, very long time, and it was not very easy because um, uh, Georgia is a bit of a different case and it's a bit a different context. We have a bit of a different situation. And um, this is something that I really wanted to touch, but I will speak a bit more about the challenges because we started our collaboration uh, not only last year, but already in 2020. And uh, there are some things that uh, need to be explained in the context that um, very often if you speak in Georgia about the Jewish culture and heritage, we always hear that there is no anti-Semitism, but I would say that the problem is that we don't know what it is and uh, there is still a lot of awareness to be raised about. Um, there has never been uh, lots of international intervention. I was always jealous about other Eastern European countries implementing so many interesting projects, which was not case in Georgia because um, Holocaust never happened in Georgia, and we were uh, always uh, the place where the, um, especially like from Eastern Europe, we also prepared an exhibition about this from Eastern Europe, the Jewish people could find a secure and safe space to survive. Um, the community itself is very close and very small, it's becoming even more and more small, so if um, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, everybody had even 30 years ago, everybody had a Jewish neighbor, classmate, and they know like what is uh, Jewish life, who are Jewish people, what is the culture, what its influence. Now, this is not the case, which is actually raising a lot of um, uh, space for uh, misinterpretation and the propaganda. Uh, and if you look, we, we did this great research about um, uh, how the Jewish history is taught in schools and what we found out there is only one page, for example, about the Holocaust in the history books throughout 12 years. So you can see that the, um, on one hand, of course, we are really lucky um, that uh, we have an amazing 26th century history with um, Jewish community and uh, it was always a safe space. Uh, and we have uh, saved the culture and the her cultural heritage and uh, this communication and uh, the uh, relationship. But on the other hand, this also caused in a way that after the community left the country, we, we don't know that there is actually a building built by the Jewish architect or a cemetery, a Jewish cemetery, for example. And I can tell you a few words about this as well. So what we did in Georgia was that we um, started to actually work with the local Jewish uh, community, especially with the young community, which was very active and very willing to open up and um, um, share their knowledge about Jewish culture with other people, because it's very important that teachers not only receive the information from the international experts and the speakers, but they can also meet the local community and get to know um, the, the, the real life of the Jewish young community. Um, we started exploring existing, uh, existing cemeteries and we also uh, started to find new cemeteries. And this was a very important moment for us because um, as I said, the context is very different. So very often uh, people uh, didn't realize that the concrete cemetery was a Jewish cemetery. Sometimes uh, Jewish uh, people in Soviet times were buried on the Armenian cemeteries. So they called it Armenian or a Russian cemetery. So even this tells a lot about how much was the awareness about it. Um, as it was already mentioned by Sophie and Fabian, we did the teacher seminars. We had uh, amazing projects developed by teachers and I see our teachers now being present on the conference and I'm really happy about it. Uh, we had um, um, projects developed all over the country. We never had a seminar or a meeting even online where we did not have teachers from all over Georgia, like across the whole country. Um, and what's the most important, there were so many like open sources developed, uh, which was really like, we really had the lack of having the resources for the teachers and educators to be used further to develop their school projects. 
Um, and uh, for me, one of the highlights, and I'm also happy that the director of our model school is here, was the model school that we organized in the eastern part of Georgia. While the western part of Georgia was very well known about the Jewish heritage, um, eastern part was never that well explored. Um, and we were really lucky that through the project we could identify like two cemeteries. Um, one of them was not even known, it was identified by our uh, partner organization, it was found by our partner organization, um, I was helping to uh, clean the place and to actually take the pictures and with the support of Israeli government we also put a sign that it's a Jewish cemetery because nobody knew the stones were even gone under, the, um, it, they were not even seen. Uh, and now it was kind of very important um, um, moment when we also put an Eastern part of Georgia on a Jewish trail and Jewish uh, history map in Georgia. Um, that's why we also decided that the model school would be in Lagodehi, it's uh, in Kacheti, it's East part of Georgia, because in Lagodehi we also found there was a very uh, lively community, um, Jewish community that already left, unfortunately, but there's a cemetery which is actually preserved absolutely only by the community, only the community is taking care. Um, and it was very important for the locals who had no idea that this cemetery is existing in the middle of the fields, uh, that it's there and they could learn a lot about it. Um, and the school pupils got involved, they had some tours, they had um, an exhibition, we did some lectures, we also did some lectures about how to read the tombstones. Um, we did the study trips to both of the cemeteries in Eastern Georgia for the pupils, uh, movie screenings, competitions inside the schools. And for me, one of the highlights of this is, um, and this is something that we just finished, so it's very recent, that almost 100 parents got involved in this. They attended the exhibitions. They, um, uh, they helped their uh, kids to participate in the competitions, and uh, they attended the movie screenings. Um, and here on the screen, you see the picture where we have the exhibition in the model school in Lagodehi. Uh, and I remember we had almost like 100 people and, um, I'm sorry, I think, uh, yeah. Um, we had uh, around like 100 people coming to this exhibition um, and um, it was very uh, heartwarming and very emotional moment for me when there were like uh, three or four or five people coming to me and saying, you know, through this exhibition, I realized that my grandmother was Jewish, uh, that my grandfather who, ha who I thought well, had a Polish surname was actually a Jew. And uh, it was a very, very heartwarming and important moment to understand that, yeah, through these materials, we don't only help teachers to develop their projects and teach their students, but you also help individuals to understand their own Jewish journey and understand their own, own Jewish um, um, uh, belonging and uh, this is of course one of the impacts that sometimes you don't foresee but it's happening and it's very important um, and here I just want to underline how important it was uh, for Georgia as a country to actually implement this project. Um, here is the one of the examples from the deep dive we have implemented deep dive project uh, in Tbilisi but we also had guests from Lagodehi uh, and from other cities, the students got the great material to actually explore the Jewish cemeteries. We have a very beautiful um, Ashkenazi cemetery in Tbilisi, which before was called as a Russian, Russian cemetery. And even the people and teach some of the teachers who visited the cemetery said, oh, I thought it was a Russian one. And now it, it's the first time I hear that it's actually a Jewish cemetery. And uh, it was also very important to change this understanding and to change this perspective. Um, on the Jewish life that it's uh, it's it's very unique and um, there is a lot to learn from this source. Um, so we created this great material and students were using this material in Tbilisi but also in um, the eastern part of Georgia while they, they did uh, participate in the competition about the Jewish cemeteries. So this is the um, Tbilisi cemetery and we have the um, uh, students coming from um, other cities. Um, and this material was very important to be done in Georgia because it's not if, if you don't have something in our language, which is very specific language, um, um, and it's um, it's very important. You can you don't have access on this knowledge. You don't have access on this um, important resources that opens up the door to um, the European heritage, the European experience, um, and so on. So it was um, a highlight also to develop this material and to give it to the school. So now it's already accessible also for different schools in Georgia. 
so to sum up my presentation and give a little bit of like the main achievements uh, list, uh, we have more than 100 teachers who are involved in uh, on regular basis. And by involved, I mean, uh, it's not only on the seminars, but it's kind of became a very um, important network uh, of the teachers who are in communication. They're, they, they are not only working with us, they're working with each other. They have already developed more than 30 complex projects and they were implemented uh, in the classroom in different schools of Georgia all over the country. Um, and this for me is also creating the bigger impact because this means that there are like uh, hundreds of pupils and there are hundreds of families who actually learn about the Jewish heritage and Jewish culture in their city. Um, we have done the whole cemetery research and the mapping. Um, and uh, this is also very important data to have. Uh, as I mentioned, we had the two cemeteries identified. Um, and you see the on the picture, the cemetery that was found. Um, I was involved in this process and I'm really happy that now the teachers are involved in this research. Because as you see, this, the stones were absolutely under the ground. You can only see like this size of the part of the uh, tombstone. Um, and many tombstones were actually used in building the houses. So people were not aware that it was existing. It was really like we heard it by um, from person to person and somebody told us it's Armenian cemetery and so on. So until like finding the stone and lifting it from the ground, it was impossible to understand if we were on the right path. And it was a really a delight to see that we were. And now it's everybody in the in this uh, small city knows that there is a Jewish cemetery and that there was a um, the Jewish um, culture was developing in the city. So we created one model school that was lasting for six months and it included hundreds of students, um, also teachers, not only from the school, but also from the whole municipality. Um, we, we help new uh, communities to uh, self-identify and find their traces. Um, we have implemented the deep dive project in Tbilisi and it was also very successful and probably what's the biggest uh, result is that the schools are proactively requesting. So it's already not that we are spreading the information and sending emails and telling people to participate, but I very often get calls that, you know, I've heard you are doing this great project and I want, always wanted to include it in my curriculum. So can I participate? How can I participate? How can I join? And uh, this circle is really enlarging like a snowball and I'm really happy for this and I'm really thankful for this opportunity. And um, I want to um, thank all partners. I want to thank the Tropa that they put Georgia in, in this great program and on the map and gave a chance um, to, to, to join this amazing experience and research and that now Georgian teachers can also participate in the impact that we are creating. So thank you very much. Well, that's great. Well, this, thank you so much, Theo. And I must say, it is, Georgia is a wonderful example of the, of the range of activities that took place as, as a result of this uh, project. And I think what you've achieved is really quite, quite remarkable. And uh, thank you, Fabian, for your remarks and, uh, and your comment on on the, the competitions and the, the, the teacher training aspect. We're now going to look at another aspect of the programme and Sophie's going to once again join us. Uh, and uh, Alexandra Fischel, who is the Educational Officer of the European Jewish Cemeteries Initiative, will be assisting Sophie in looking at these other aspects of the programme. Yes, thank you. And we will also be joined by Katerina Malakova, who is the ESJF's historical researcher, and she will yes help me tell you about what we've been doing. Can you see my screen? Do that. Can you see the screen, Michael? Uh, yes, yes, we can. Okay. Um, so I will now speak a little bit more on how the ESJF's work within the grant fits into the broader scope of the ESJF's mission and activities. As the ESJF's main work is the physical protection of Jewish cemeteries, so building fences around cemeteries, um, our main focus on the grant has been to give important stakeholders that we already work with, such as mayors, local authorities, um, the information, tools and support they need to preserve Jewish cemeteries, because we can't physically preserve them all in the time that we have and the money that we have. 
We identified four areas of work that could help us with our mission, which we will discuss during this session. Um, I'll now pass you over to Katya, who is going to talk on our masterclasses and regional cemetery associations. Hi, everyone. My name is Katerina Molakova. I'm a historical researcher of ESGF. And I will tell some words about our master classes on Jewish Heritage Protection uh, Program. So um, during the last 18 months, six master classes for the engaged leaders uh, uh, named master classes on Jewish Heritage Preservation were held. As uh, Philip Carmel said, we aim to involve not only educators, but also the local leaders which means mayors, activists, officials on different levels, museum workers, and so on, to the protection of Jewish cemeteries. Unfortunately, not all of the people uh, have enough knowledge about Jewish heritage and feel enough responsibility on that. Uh, so the purpose of, that, of these masterclasses was to interest them, to share the basic knowledge and experience in preserving Jewish heritage. As I said, six, six masterclasses were organized four online in Georgia, Lithuania, Ukraine, and Hungary, and two in person in Moldova and Poland. Uh, in total, they were attended by about 300 participants and about 200 more were unable to attend the masterclass, but they had registered and had an opportunity to watch the recording of the masterclass. Um, such an interest surprised and uh, to be honest, delighted us uh, for example, in Ukraine, more than 100 people uh, registered for the masterclass and more than 50 found the possibility to attend it uh, despite massive blockouts, uh, uh, blackouts this winter. Uh, the basic program included lectures on Jewish heritage and Jewish seminars, uh, cemeteries as a part of it, uh, roundtables on various ways of preserving heritage and uh, local case studies on successful projects uh, to preserve the Jewish heritage. Participants shared their own experience, which we considered the most important part. And uh, what else was important is the discussions about what participants can do to preserve their, their Jewish cemeteries, Jewish cemeteries at their places, just now being on their place. Uh, as a result, we learned how many interesting and devoted people who are absolutely not connected to Jewish community, uh, are interested in working with Jewish heritage and are conducting or planning to conduct their own projects. Uh, to clear to study, to preserve Jewish cemeteries, to include them into museum space and uh, so on. So I would say that the context with these people is the thing that can ensure our sustainable work on preserving Jewish cemeteries in future. And thus our Next activity connected to that is to begin the work on creating a kind of common platform, more precisely a number of local platforms that would allow local leaders to maintain contacts, to share their experiences, to ask for advice and uh, help in preserving Jewish cemeteries in working on their places. We call it regional cemetery associations. And I need to say that it is very sensitive work as it must take into account the contribution of all organizations involved in the preservation of Jewish heritage in all uh, given countries. So we are working on that project in Poland where even a kickoff meeting was held as a part of the masterclass. In Ukraine, when we, uh, where we choose um, the specific format of that work, which is a telegram group and it is working now, uh, and in Hungary, where we are negotiating about such a common platform, which will allow to share the experience and to ask for advice and help for all people who are working with Jewish cemeteries on the places, with a local non-formal group uh, who is planning such uh, a platform now, led by Esther Susan and Marianne Frank. Uh, and I uh, need to say that we really hope that that part of work, the direct contacts with local leaders who are directly responsible for the Jewish, Jewish heritage and Jewish cemeteries in their towns and villages and cities is the very, very important part of our work. And it is our hope, hope for the future and for the further preservation of Jewish cemeteries. Thank you so much. 
Thank you very much. Um, and just to add quickly um, that we concluded our masterclasses with a big conference in Budapest where we invited all of the participants from the masterclasses as well as local stakeholders to uh, yeah, discuss again this topic of best practices and to give public authorities um, the knowledge and tools they need to preserve Jewish cemeteries. Um, I'm now going to talk a little bit about the um, legal research that we have done, um, but I will not go into too much detail because um, we will have a presentation later today from one of our experts. Um, the core um, reason for doing the legal research was to provide an updated assessment of the legal statuses of Jewish cemeteries in Europe, as well as the legal challenges faced by those preserving Jewish cemeteries, particular in the places where there is no Jewish community or a small Jewish community to um, take care of the cemeteries. Our hope is that this research can be used as a toolkit to help others overcome legal obstacles. Um, we additionally wanted to create a network among um, the project countries of legal experts who can further dis discussion on preservation of Jewish cemeteries through legal frameworks. Um, and also we, um, so through what we, through our research and our webinar, we partnered with experts from across Europe and um, organizations such as the International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists. And following um, the conf uh, this conference today, we will launch our online forum where we have a specific thread dedicated to the discussion of legal challenges. And we hope that our experts will connect with those who are seeking advice and knowledge for free to support them in overcoming um, challenges that they face. Um, I'm now going to hand over to um, Alexandra Fischel, who will talk now on drone technology and our hackathon. Okay, hi everyone. Um, okay, as the previous uh, girls tell, uh, I want to uh, just add that uh, uh, the main idea of ESJAP is how to preserve the Jewish cemeteries. And uh, we were thinking who are responsible for uh, its preservation? The first auditory we, were, we started to work, it was the teachers and students. And then we pass our we share our knowledge and pass this uh, uh, to Centropa, and they are very, very well, much better than me than we uh, in this field. And um, uh, then uh, we were thinking, okay, who else responsible? And we made a lot of uh, uh, different events for local historians and uh, uh, local museum and uh, library workers as well. Um, then we were thinking that during our uh, research, we have so many demolished and overbuilt cemeteries. Why they are demolished and overbuilt? Is it only the government position or uh, it depends also on the people on their places? And we decided to try to go to the very different auditory. It's an engineering and geodesic students who will be the next, uh, the people who are responsible for uh, the all land, you know, and uh, um, they will be seeking the contract to overbill or not this uh, piece of uh, um, of uh, um, their uh, city or their country, their um, countryside. Uh, so we create uh, the very very special program uh, based on our knowledge uh, um, with uh, the drone technology. Um, surveys uh, and in cooperation with Drone UA, uh, it's the company who are very well known in the world. Uh, they are they led a lot of different uh, webinars and uh, seminars to about the drones, and they are using in different fields. And one of these fields is the heritage preservation. Mm -hmm. So we made uh, three years of different. Uh, uh, drone courses for uh, the engineering students and uh, we engage more than 200 students all over the Europe and uh, uh, from the feedback we know that uh, like 90 percent of them first time uh, first time uh, uh, knew that uh, there is the Jewish cemetery somewhere 
And um, this year, thanks to European uh, Union, uh, European Commission, we uh, try the new project, which is called Hackathon. Uh, it's the very interesting uh, seminar. Um, we like uh, when you just give the lecture and webinars is the one thing. And one when you try to give some tools and then ask students to create their own ideas how to preserve uh, the Jewish cemeteries using this drone technology or uh, different computer, uh, very, very high uh, level project uh, programs. Uh, it uh, give also for us the new ideas. And uh, I hope this pilot project, we will um, make like our um, every year project as we uh, did for um, other. Um, uh, we, I, I want also to say that uh, all, uh, all of these um, things are uh, for protection and uh, the legal uh, things which uh, Sophie uh, talked about and uh, this uh, administration thinks uh, it's uh, uh, only the first step and we hope to be able to prolong it. Sophie, I'm giving you uh, the words. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. So um, we're very much almost finished now. So just to give you a little bit of an idea on the next steps, what we hope to do um, based on the work we have done in the past 18 months. So we would love to do more educational events um, based on the knowledge and methods we've gathered during this grant. We also hope to work with our new partners to do further awareness raising and preservation work. Um, we met so many partners in the project um, and we then actually went on to do, um, for example, fencing projects um, where we did our um, Moldova masterclass. The participants visited a Jewish cemetery and we have now fenced and protected that Jewish cemetery, which I think is really incredible based on the partnerships we've developed. Uh, we also hope to run our um, regional cemetery associations and continue guiding and supporting others. And finally, and um, through tools such as our online forum, we hope to facilitate legal supports and other kinds of support. Um, so yes, the work that's happened under this grant will certainly outlive the grant. And we, we hope that this, yes, will be very sustainable and that we, we can bu continue building upon it in the future. Thank you very much. I'll pass back to Michael now. Oh, no, that, well, that's terrific, Sophie. And I'm sure if, for all of us, we're getting a very strong sense of the breadth of this project, different aspects that the project addressed. And we're going to hear from other people in the course of this afternoon, which will further uh, demonstrate this uh, in, in various ways. Now, the, the project covered seven countries in Eastern Europe, and one of those countries was Ukraine. Obviously, it has been challenging for the project to, to to look at what could be done in Ukraine, but from our point of view, it was very important that Ukraine continue to be in this project and make its contribution. And Ed Sorota is now going to address this. Over to you, Ed. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, so I see that uh, I'm thrilled that we still have uh, 86 people uh, on the call and I wanna give a shout out to three of them. Uh, one of whom is back when uh, in the mid 1980s when I was uh, exploring Jewish Central Europe uh, and visiting Jewish cemeteries, I had as a, uh, a partner, companion and guide, Ruth Ellen Gruber, uh, who has the project, if you don't know of Jewish Heritage Europe, uh, write it down and look it up. Um, Ruth was a great person to travel with as we went through cemeteries. Um, at, uh, at throughout the throughout the region, I learned a lot from her, and I'm sure all of us can. Um, so Ruth, good to see you here. I also want to give a shout out now that we talk about um, uh, Ukraine uh, to Marla and Jay Osborne, who are kind of like, shall we say, lab rats uh, of uh, of of what can be done uh, with a Jewish cemetery in a town they absolutely fell in love with. As a matter of fact, they won't let go of it. Um, and they are involved, and uh, uh, um, Jay with an IT background, and Marla with a background uh, in law, and which means that she is a skilled negotiator. 
means that uh, they have been able to work with people in a small town, Rohatan, uh, and work with the people in the town, whether it is librarians, whether it's city administrators. The idea is not to create enemies or, or conflict, but to find as many people as possible to work with. It's a real model, and I've always been impressed with it. Uh, and it shows what can be done throughout the region. Uh, and then, of course, I see on the call, we have Larissa uh, Holovka. Um, I don't care where you are on the, of the, 80, uh, of the uh, 83 now other people on the call, none of you live in a place like Japarisia. Uh, but uh, uh, Larissa does, and that's as close to the front line as anybody should rightly be. Um, now, my idea of working in Ukraine really uh, uh, came about uh, in, in the city of Riv Rovno, Rivna, and that was in 2013, I went with two elderly women who were born there. They live in Greensboro, North Carolina, and one of them carries with them a beautiful North Carolina accent. Uh, but she was actually born in Rivna, was actually a Yiddish speaker when she was born. I ended up making, uh, and the rest of us at Centropa made a multimedia film in which these two women narrate their story about being hidden by a family outside of Rivna. Uh, and then in 2016, Fabian Rula's team and myself, we held a seminar in Rivna for teachers from the region. Uh, and we showed this film, this 20 minute multimedia film narrated in English with Ukrainian subtitles. Uh, the two women narrated the, the, the film, their own film. Uh, and, uh, and, and teachers and students and their parents came to the film. I didn't think anything more about it. I didn't, uh, we had to get back to Kiev the next day. The next day when we were driving, we went by the Jewish cemetery. And what did I see? Parents and their students cleaning up the Jewish cemetery. No one asked them to. It was not part of our program. I didn't even think of it, but this completely floored me. Uh, and what this told us was, um, uh, is, is that if you make a, a project that is compelling enough, you'll get this kind. Of, you'll, you'll get that kind of feedback. So uh, what that showed me was that there's genuine interest, and they were learning from it. Now, um, the important point, and this is what Fabian's team has done so well with, is if if you're going to combat anti-Semitism, the one of the most important things you're going to, have to do is play the long game. And if you're going to play the long game in order to uh, get results, you're going to have to turn teenagers into stakeholders in their town's Jewish heritage and history. How do you do that? You have competitions. The teenage brain and the word competition has never been fully explored, but God knows give a teenager a competition to be in and they'll be all over it. Um, the, uh, um, uh, Fabian's team in Ukraine and other places are doing where the kids are making their own walking tour apps. They're making their own videos of their town's Jewish history, and they're making their own podcasts. This is how you turn them into stakeholders, and this we're doing all over Ukraine. I have now spent seven weeks in Ukraine since the beginning, uh, since August, uh, and I'll be coming back again soon to torment Marla and Jay. Uh, and also meeting with our teachers uh, from the east of the country, from the west of the country to the east of the country. Um, and then what we're going to be doing uh, is, is visiting the, what I'll be doing is visiting the schools. But let me tell you about what it means uh, for, for creating a stakeholder. And this goes to Larissa, who's on the call now. Uh, and this is the, uh, uh, this is someone uh, who's uh, from uh, uh, as I said, from Shaparija. Sophie, can you show, can you share the screen and show those uh, a few pictures that we have from Japarija, if that's possible? That's the first picture. That's from, that's the picture that was taken. Uh, we'll stay there for a second. That's a picture taken in Rivna. Um, that's a cemetery that had not been cleaned up in decades. Show a film, make them stakeholders, this is what the result was. Now we can go to the Japarisha picture, the next one. So let's, so that's Larissa there on the right. These are her students. Now, here's what she, I'm, I'm reading her letter to us. It's been translated. Um, so today, the, uh, the youth of the local history club are searching for the missing Jewish cemeteries in Japarisha and are using old maps. Some of them they've downloaded. Uh, this is the second cemetery our young people are researching. And by the way, what you're hearing here is perfect project-based learning. 
So here's what she says. The first cemetery they did was on the island of uh, Cortegia, I'm probably mispronouncing that, and we entered a competition, uh, a Centropa competition, in which young people took on the role of researchers. They tried everything for the first time. Teachers love it when teenagers try their hands at multiple disciplines. They filmed, they photographed, they edited, they translated, they made voiceovers, they tried to read the inscriptions on the Matseva, Matseva. Uh, They studied the Jewish history uh, of the city and of Ukraine. They learned to research thanks to the materials and the brochure we received from Centropa, which they continue to send us today and that we continue to use. And we attended online master classes from experts. The students asked many questions and received detailed answers. It was through this program that the students fell in love with Jewish history and began to dream of a local history club and doing further research. You can show another picture, Sophie. Uh, we learned how to work collaboratively and to support each other. Um, and, and then we had a lot of fun and unexpectedly won second place in a Centropa competition. So this, we can look at, this is, this is, this is major stuff. These are kids living in a war zone, not in a war zone. They're living in Japarizia, which is directly on the front line. Most of the families have lived, they've stayed. But there is a, uh, that's a longer conversation and for another time to talk about how Ukrainians today um, uh, are looking at their Jewish heritage uh, in ways uh, uh, that have surprised us all, in including us. We have a total of, um, uh, uh, when, since we started doing seminars in Ukraine, we had, uh, uh, in 2016, uh, we had six seminars, 450 teachers applied to come. We could only fit in because of budget and space, 250. Uh, and we just did two seminars that, that uh, uh, I helped run in ivano frankivsk and Kiev. Uh, and Larissa, and that photograph right there in the center, she traveled 20 hours uh, to, uh, to join us. Uh, and um, and she did. Uh, and what we what we feel that we have here uh, is 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 a is a project that we can grow enormously. Jewish cemeteries work as teaching tools. Um, I think that's enough for me to say. Thank you very much. Wow, that that's truly extraordinary. And to think that such activities are going on against the backdrop of the war, I mean, it really is quite something. In talks to their in, their commitment to addressing this subject. So thank you so much for that, Ed. Absolutely fascinating. So we're now going to turn to um, tourists and pilgrims. Uh, there were two pieces of significant research that the Foundation for Jewish Heritage undertook as part of this project. One was on the potential of Jewish cemeteries as visitor destinations. And this was conducted by Dr. Paul Darby. And he will now give an overview of the assignment and what he discovered. So, Paul, I hope you're there. Over to you. <laughs> yep, I'm here. Just good, getting good, good. technology, all the little ducks in a row. There we go. Great. And Sophie, can I share my screen now, please? Yes, you should be able to do it. There, it works, that's excellent. Um, thanks very much and good afternoon, everybody. Um, Ed, you'll notice I found my body again. So, so things, things are good. Um, and how do I follow, how do I follow what you just said? How do I, how do I follow that? Um, with those people, those young people committing to, to the future of Jewish heritage in Europe in, in the worst circumstances. Um, I have to just say that the, the colleagues we worked with in Ukraine were, no matter what they were undergoing, were always there delivering for us on this, this report. And so I definitely, somebody mentioned Andre earlier on, and I'd like to just say thank you, Andre, and put that on the record. And a definite thank you to those in Centropa and ESJF who supported me with data gathering and to those across Europe who contributed time and thought to our questions. And some of them are on the call today and it's excellent. One day we'll meet in person. 
and the report is very much a team effort. So this report is a snapshot of Jewish, of Jewish cemetery tourism in seven European countries. And this report provides examples of Jewish cemeteries which are developing themselves as heritage sites. It considers the potential range of visitors and the role which sustainable tourism goals and innovative technologies might have in both sustaining sites and engaging new and diverse audiences. In common with the other initiatives we, we're hearing about today, the study is rooted in a commitment to local populations and local action to create sustainable solutions for preservation and promotion that those communities and groups of communities will take forward. And some of those people, I'm glad to say, made direct contributions to this report. On the subject of research, the research found that we need more data, more research into the phenomenon of Jewish cemeteries as heritage destinations, who's visiting, why, what are their needs, what is the impact of their visit on the site, on the local community, what are the most effective forms of promotion, what's the best way to interpret sites, what local benefits are accrued, how do you engage different communities. I suggest this work might come from partnerships between those responsible for cemeteries and schools, colleges and universities, getting the next generation's intellectual thinkers aware and involved. Another gap is the one sector with a couple of notable exceptions, which did not engage the commercial tourism sector. As initiatives develop and move forward, there will need to be ways found to engage and open the eyes of the commercial tourism sector to this aspect of European heritage. We keep returning to people on the ground. Many of these individuals do what they do voluntarily. Often they have other jobs, teachers, farmers, librarians, students, priests. There are also the entrepreneurs, tour guides, historical researchers, genealogists, whose livelihoods are predicated on revealing and engaging with these cemeteries to create or to restore human bonds across time and space and to educate in the broadest sense. Let's also acknowledge the next generation they inspire as we've been doing today, inspire them to engage with, sustain and promote these sites. As we build partnerships, I think we need to understand more about why people commit to cemetery heritage, so as to be able to effectively encourage others to engage. Contributors to this report might see the Jewish cemetery as part of their faith heritage, or as part of their personal heritage, or local or European heritage, or a combination thereof. And as with all heritage, that without people on the ground, little, if anything, can be sustained or made accessible. Each of the countries examined in this report has its own story, its own context, its own rules, its own governances, and its own challenges. All of the countries face the challenge of finding the financial and human resources and the advocacy to develop these sites as visitor destinations. That's common to all. Encouraging and engaging visitors needs to play a part of meeting this challenge. The urgency of work to preserve, sustain and promote this part of our European heritage competes alongside other priorities at local, regional, national and European level. So there's no one answer that can be looked for when thinking about how the Jewish cemetery can be sustained and promoted through its attraction to visitors. Rather, stakeholders will build solutions through partnerships, through networking, and by ensuring all other stakeholders have a voice in the process of policy making and planning. And that all takes time, which is of the essence of this with this project. But it is a long game, as Ed said. This report is just a starting point. One of the challenges contributors noted um, in the report is ignorance or downright denial to not put too fine a point on it, about the presence of Jewish cemetery heritage 
by local tourist offices and officials engaged with promoting local heritage. There are no Jewish cemeteries in this region, to quote a tourism officer, in a region which has several historic Jewish cemeteries. It will not help anyone who wishes to promote all of their local heritage to visitors near and far if the local professionals are not even aware of what is in their own community. Are those charged with promoting heritage aware of all the potential sources of information about sites, as well as what and where those sites are? Several contributors mentioned how Jewish cemeteries which have been documented by experts are missing from the tourist maps and signage of certain places. Here's an example from Seged. People there produced really impressive visitor tools to promote the city's Jewish heritage. You can download it onto your phone wherever you are. But they still struggle, struggle to get this integrated into the city's main tourist office, uh, main tourist offering by inclusion on all the city maps produced for visitors, for example. And as you can see here, if you put cemetery into Seged's tourist site, you don't get any, any response, even though there's a fantastic app a part which was produced as part of the Interreg um, initiative. And yet the local tourist board doesn't have the Jewish cemetery on their heritage website. What's what's happened there? How can that be how can that be changed? It wouldn't happen with a medieval church building or the birthplace of a nationally known poet, and it mustn't happen in the future with Jewish cemeteries. We need to challenge the ignorance, the assumptions and the narratives which underpin this blindness to Jewish cemetery heritage. There are some good examples of where stakeholders already recognise the value of Jewish cemeteries as worth promoting to diverse visitors. On the local scale, Brody in Ukraine, Kalarashi in Moldova both promote the local Jewish cemetery in materials for visitors in their own small ways. Vilnius includes its Jewish heritage in information for visitors. And on the national scale, Poland's national heritage portal Zabitek, which you can see here, is accessible in Polish and English and showcases the country's Jewish cemeteries as part of the national heritage inventory. For me, Zabitek is a leader. The quality of the website's presentation, excellent photography, key information for visitors, and the website's accessibility to both Polish and foreign visitors means that the visitor comes away not just with more choice as to where they might visit, but also an enriched understanding of Poland's surviving national heritage. So again, if I was a local tourism or heritage leader seeking to sustain and promote a local Jewish cemetery, I would want to start conversations and advocacy for having the cemetery represent on as many tourist and heritage websites as was possible. Jewish cemeteries mean different things to those who identify as Jews than to those who identify as non-Jews. We have to remember that. Some groups have a more intense spiritual encounter when visiting. Consider the cemeteries featured on the two Hungarian religious routes. The, o, the grave or Ohel of Tzadik or Rebbe is the goal of pilgrimage for the faithful. The presence of the faithful visitor can bring life and dynamism to a cemetery, reminding other visitors that this space is for some holy space. As with all heritage sites with spiritual and religious significance, those managing sites report that it is sometimes very difficult, if not impossible, to reconcile the expectations and desires of different groups who sometimes fail to take any account of each other. There is no easy solution to this, but I would suggest building partnerships where different voices are heard Perhaps small solutions can be found to ease tensions. And again, could networking with those managing other forms of religious heritage sites in Europe be useful? How do they deal with competing needs? I'm pleased I was given the title Pilgrims and Visitors for this contribution as stakeholders who consider their visitors are better equipped to meet their needs and make the engagement more profound. Jewish cemetery visitors are a diverse bunch. Let's consider the visitor who comes from roots and remembrance. This aspect or type of tourism practice is focusing increased attention on Jewish cemeteries in the region by those who live elsewhere. As interest in genealogy and recognizing one's roots grows, so desires to experience the old country also grows. Jewish cemeteries in this can bring together communities across the world. And I know there are people present on the call who do very important work in that respect. 
Ireland and Ghana are two countries which are powerful examples of places which have built relationships with their diasporas. In those two countries, routes of remembrance tourism forms part of strategic policy and planning and is embedded in economic and heritage promotion. Perhaps there is a dialogue to be had with heritage bodies about the power of diasporic tourism, which can sustain the Jewish cemetery. And the Jewish cemetery is important both to descendants whose family lie in those cemeteries and to people in the seven countries who do research for them, who arrange their travel, who tour guide for them. The message from tour guides was clear. We're the link between our home communities and those elsewhere who feel a link with our community. We bring economic and intellectual gain to our communities. We add to the sum of knowledge about who lies in our cemeteries and the stories they can tell about our communities. For these young entrepreneurs, the Jewish cemetery is a resource which is not only valuable as a heritage asset, but also as an archive of the community, which speaks to people both local and distant. I chose this image of the Khatam Sofer Memorial in Bratislava as an illustration of a high quality controlled environment where visitors are welcomed, whether for prayer or personal witness, or because of cultural or historical curiosity and a desire to learn more about the Jewish experience in, in the city, which is recognized and promoted by the city in partnership with communal advocates. Those who are charged with sustaining Jewish cemeteries achieve positive results when they make themselves heard, express their needs, and through dialogue act with partners across the heritage and tourism sectors at local, regional, and national levels. As an example, how might advocates of this heritage raise awareness with those governmentally or commercially engaged with encouraging tourism across countries and regions? Where are the gaps in official and commercial understanding which advocacy needs to plug? Where are young people invited in to support advocacy and promotion, to challenge and address the gaps in official organizational knowledge and recognition, to use their creativity to promote these sites to wider audiences? Contributors to the research were clear that on organized cultural heritage tours, groups seek a diversity of experiences of which a cemetery visit is just one part. I agree, however, I do not agree with one tour guide who went on to say that Jewish cemetery tourism ought to be solely a Jewish practice, an activity which witnesses faith and underlines their identity, and that non-Jewish visitors ought not to engage with these sites. That is exclusionary, and it has no part in sustaining Jewish cemeteries as part of European heritage. Inclusivity is vital when considering who might come as a visitor because of the specific rather than general heritage contract context of the Jewish cemetery in this region of Europe. In order to combat anti-Semitism, in order to combat Holocaust denial or the downgrading of Jewish trauma in the 20th century, we must continue to point out and promote the significance of the Jewish cemetery as shared heritage in the consciousness of all Europeans, Jewish and non-Jewish, and that's where tie-ins with education. The Jewish needs to be sustained and promoted as witness to European values of diversity, tolerance, interdependence and justice. A plurality, a, a plurality, sorry, I'll start again. A plurality of potential visitors needs to be engaged. As Halise Lieberman of the Taube Foundation in Warsaw puts it, Jewish cemeteries need to be transformative spaces, perhaps a space where tourists become pilgrims. I'd like to touch briefly on sustainability in Jewish cemetery heritage, which is, is expanded on in the report. The need to demonstrate sustainability in all aspects of planning for your community's futures will become more and more apparent. Each country is at a different stage of dealing with this challenge, depending on its particular context and national priorities. The research confirmed that even the terminologies used vary from place to place and have slightly different meanings to different people. But it is at its root is the recognition that every local environment is part of a bigger environment made up of diverse forms of life which know no borders. Jewish cemetery heritage promoters are already building partnerships, networking and supporting each other by engaging formally with European initiatives, by membership of the cultural routes of Europe, visit, visibly sponsoring the European route of Jewish heritage. Perhaps they might investigate contributing to Europeana, 
the Digital Cultural Heritage Portal as a place for preserving images of sites, maps of art, etc. I've referenced Europeana's Jewish history tours at the end of this presentation. These are tools which will help more sites raise their profile and secure an audience at a pan-national level. There are plenty more red dots to go on that map. Thinking about sustainability, sustainability also flags up a note of caution about new technologies. They are tools, not panaceas, and they come with inbuilt challenges of sustainability, management, etc. They do not replace people in place. Similarly, unfinished or semi-functional websites, of which I came across several, do nothing to encourage the visitor. Attention needs to be paid to what the visitor experiences, no matter where the encounter happens, on site or virtually. What is particularly relevant to Jewish cemetery heritage is that work to sustain and promote them needs to be consciously part of wider national goals of sustaining heritage. All heritage needs to be part of planning for sustainable tourism development. Those planning for sustainable and beneficial visitor activity at regional and national levels need to know what you regard, what you as engaged heritage leaders are doing and thinking about Jewish cemeteries. They need to have a clear idea what, that Jewish cemeteries are part of your heritage assets. And that is, it is, it is vital that planning for future sustainable activity takes the needs of heritage and how it can help sustain local communities. Watch out for more information in the near future about an initiative called Jewish Heritage as Leverage for Sustainable Tourism or Jewels Tours Initiative, a collaboration between Jewish Heritage Network and the Interreg Programme, which aims to provide pathways for building sustainable tourism into Jewish heritage promotion. To conclude, a very small number of contributors to the research told me that Jewish cemeteries in this region should be left to vanish, that any attempts to secure their futures and promote them was a waste of time and effort. I firmly reject such views. And so do the committed individuals and organisations who are already successfully sustaining sites through attracting visitors. Such an attitude doesn't help the communities in which the heritage is located. It does not enrich people's understanding of what Judaism is, what Europe means and the relationship between the two. The benefits need to flow both ways. Sustaining and promoting the Jewish cemetery should sustain and promote your communities and sustain and promote the heritage and values of our Europe for all Europeans. Our local heritage is European and our European heritage is always local. Consciously incorporating Jewish cemetery heritage into wider heritage, community engagement and education and tourism policies is one way we might secure and sustain this heritage for generations to come. Thanks very much. Okay, that's great, Paul. It's great to get this overview and the snapshot um, of the um, situation. And, um, you know, you're really doing quite pioneering work. And I think it'll be interesting to see what develops in this area over the coming years, and um, hopefully uh, in positive ways. Of course, the, the legal aspects of, of dealing with Jewish cemeteries is also very important. And we're now going to turn to the law. Um, and we're going to hear from Vito Nadeshkevich, who is chief executive of Lawcraft and a board member of the iconic Rohatin Jewish Heritage Project in Ukraine that Ed was highlighting previously. So Vito, if I can now hand over to you. Hello. Yep. Hello, Vito. Uh, you're on mute, Vito. I take it, I take it so free, Vito can, yes, great. Hello. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this conference. Uh, it is a pleasure and a honor for me. Uh, I want uh, to uh, told you that uh, the history and the culture is my hobby from uh, the childhood. And uh, my profession is a lawyer. So uh, I think it logical why this team is very interesting for me, not only in theory, but also in uh, practice. Uh, I was a member of the team uh, that was prepared a report on the legal aspects of the preservation of Jewish cultural heritage and Jewish cemeteries 
and sites of uh, Holocaust mass graves. We have analyzed international law as well as national law, both of countries from the European Union, but also outside it. In particular, it was uh, Poland, Lithuania, Ukraine, Moldova, Hungary, and uh, Georgia. Uh, we tried to estimate uh, the uh, state of compliance with legislation uh, norms, uh, identified problems and the uh, points of the best practice. We also uh, try to share our own experience in this field. Uh, I personally took part in several projects in Ukraine, uh, Rohatyn, also Sambir, Dobromel, Stare Sambir, uh, Lviv, and uh, some other. As you know, there is a huge amount of Jewish cemeteries in Europe, and especially in uh, Eastern Europe. So this problem is uh, really um, on time, uh, because unfortunately, the history of the 20th century was tragic, as you, as you know, and now there are no uh, local communities who uh, um, could uh, help to maintain uh, these cemeteries and to uh, organize a st uh, uh, stable uh, maintenance and uh, sustainable management of uh, cemeteries as important religious and also cultural and historical sites, it uh, very important to make uh, a comprehensive uh, legal norms. In general, the essence of legal protection of Jewish cemeteries uh, join different spheres of a law. Um, I think that uh, maybe the most important thing is uh, that uh, we deal with uh, human rights, guarantees of religion freedom, uh, also right uh, of poverty, right uh, of non-discrimination. Very often uh, we could uh, saw uh, this um, explanation in trial in court practice, uh, first of all, um, because European uh, Council of, of European uh, Parliament Assembly decided that Jewish cultural heritage is the integral part of the shared cultural heritage in Europe. And also that uh, uh, anyway, if even on first point of view, uh, the article eight is talking only about uh, uh, rights of uh, human uh, body square life, but it's also, uh, have links here yeah, to their uh, feelings and uh, uh, their um, um, religious feelings here yeah, to their relatives. That's why in uh, court and trial practice, we could use this article also when we are talking about uh, cemeteries and uh, uh, mass graves. Uh, sites. Uh, so, uh, the, excuse me, do you see my presentation? Yes, we do. We oh, we thank you. Yep. So, this is why it's important to use all human rights uh, norms when we want to protect uh, Jewish cemeteries. Uh, the second thing is uh, property uh, rights and restitution. Uh, in European Union countries, the situation is much better, but it's not uh, also ideal. Very often we have laws uh, that uh, make in theory this uh, process of restitution as we have in Poland or in Lithuania, but in practice, uh, they are not so effective because, for example, in Lithuania, uh, no Jewish organizations can um, prove 
uh, that they are successors of all Jewish organizations that uh, uh, was active between uh, the Holocaust, between the Second World War. In Poland, for example, uh, now the work of restitution uh, commission was blocked uh, uh, by the politicians. Uh, and so uh, we have legislation, but uh, in practice, it's not effective. Unfortunately, uh, in countries uh, that are not a members of European Union, very often, in general, there is no norms that give, even in theory, the possibility to take your property uh, back. Uh, also, uh, the third sphere of uh, legal protection of Jewish cemetery is culture heritage preservation. And uh, of course, we understand that very often the Jewish cemetery is the uh, oldest object of cultural and historic sites in the whole uh, region. And uh, it's that's why it's very important, not only, I think, for a Jewish community, but for history of a town, of the city, of a country, a whole country, to uh, preserve such uh, historical sites. And uh, also, it's uh, very important here yeah, to uh, have special norms in cadastre and uh, special planning. Uh, because uh, for a long time, uh, many cemeteries were not identified. And for example, on the same parcel, on the same territory, uh, it could be organized a park, yeah, a sport yard, or sometimes it could be also uh, some new buildings. Yeah? For example, uh, as uh, well known, uh, case in uh, Polish uh, Kalish, where the complex of public schools were built uh, in the territory of the old uh, Jewish uh, cemetery. In the same time, uh, we should analyze here yeah, how uh, government is uh, um, realize established rights and obligations here, yeah? because uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, case of application of the legislation in practice, compliance. Very often, uh, governmental bodies and the official forget yet about laws, and they have no motivation to implement uh, norms uh, in practice. Unfortunately, uh, only some countries have a state programs to preserve Jewish heritage. And outside the European Union, no countries, no Ukraine, no uh, Georgia, no Moldova has such uh, programs. And when you have no program, it means that you have no budget, no uh, financing line to realize uh, even the best uh, um, legislative uh, norms. It's a big problem. For example, as we see uh, in Ukraine, yeah, uh, several weeks ago, uh, yeah, the 18th uh, of uh, June, uh, very important monument, monument of architecture of uh, national importance in Ukraine, great synagogue in Brody uh, that was built in the 19th century. It was on a list of these monuments, so the Ministry of Culture and the uh, government of Lviv district should uh, preserve and maintain this building, but uh, the roof uh, was ruined because uh, of neglect of all uh, governmental uh, bodies. And we, like Lviv uh, Jewish community, were writing uh, to Ministry of Culture, to Governor, 
of Lviv D Street bus, uh, uh, you could see uh, the result. And this is really a big problem, especially in uh, countries that are not in European Union. For a long time, the most uh, effective uh, and relevant uh, legal instrument to protect historical sites of uh, Jewish history and culture was a system of agreements between the government of United States of America and governments of East European countries. It's interesting that one of the oldest uh, agreement uh, was signed uh, between uh, United States and Ukraine. Yeah, it was in 1994. And after uh, that, they signed uh, typical agreements with uh, other uh, Eastern European countries that are members of uh, Euro Union are or not members. And uh, this was really uh, a good instrument uh, to protect uh, uh, our rights in a court. But of course, uh, it uh, was not uh, a system of uh, preservation in a country uh, because uh, it should be regulated by the uh, national uh, legislation. Uh, so I think that uh, United States uh, play a very positive uh, role in this field, but uh, now it's really time of uh, European uh, Union, uh, because uh, as uh, we know, the majority of East European countries starting uh, the uh, adaptation of the national laws to European laws and uh, Euro Union and its uh, legislation is a paragon for these countries. That's why uh, Euro Union uh, is creating here yeah, a common legal field, common principles and guarantees for protection. It is also a model of uh, countries uh, planning uh, to join European uh, unions and start integration and adaptative uh, the national uh, uh, laws. Uh, that's uh, uh, why uh, such uh, documents and the resolution 1883 are very important, not only for European country, but uh, for uh, the uh, whole uh, region. In any case, if we analyze many cases in uh, Poland or in Lithuania, it could be a case uh, with this public school in Kalish, and uh, it could be a case with the uh, Palace of Sports in Vilnius. It could be a case of uh, city park in Sambir in Ukraine. Yeah, or uh, it could be also a case with the old uh, Jewish cemetery in Dobromil is also uh, in Ukraine. We understand that uh, if we want to achieve good results and really to preserve cemeteries and uh, I think not only cemeteries, but uh, Jewish heritage uh, in general, yeah, we should join different strategies, yeah, because we could not uh, use only legal uh, instruments. They are very important, and this is a base, yeah, of our actions, yeah, to preserve heritage. But also we should understand that Every time we should join legal strategy with communication, cooperation, and education uh, strategy uh, to join our efforts with local community, not uh, only uh, to argue with uh, uh, governmental bodies that uh, unfortunately uh, are neglects and uh, are not. Uh, active in uh, uh, this field. So what you're and, saying, uh, Peter, so what you're saying you is there's a campaigning aspect to this in terms of awareness raising and getting people to engage locally to recognize the significance of the cemetery. And this will help to 
improve the climate and make the broader climate more sympathetic towards preservation. That's yeah, very important is also to uh, make a list of all cemeteries and uh, other uh, religious and cultural sites and input them to the national registers here, yeah? yes. because it gives uh, a possibility of this sustainable uh, maintenance and management of uh, these sites. Uh, so this is uh, the short-term version of uh, our report and my work, and I think that we will present uh, the whole report uh, as soon as possible uh, during this month. And uh, also, if uh, you have some questions, uh, we could uh, discuss these questions now, or, or you could yes. write me uh, these questions to my uh, mail or to WhatsApp. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Vito. Sophie, thank you very much. No, thank you. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating and so so important and, and really quite fundamental. And what you were saying sort of tied in with what Phil was saying earlier about the whole. The, the crucial importance of the mapping exercise so that we've got the hard data to know exactly where these cemeteries are right across Europe. And clearly that can then be the, the start of ensuring that these places are looked after, are preserved and are used in the different ways that we've been talking about today, which is, you know, educationally as visitor destinations, etc. So thank you so much for that, Vito. And in terms of people getting in touch with you, this will be something that Sophie will organise at the end you're of this. welcome thank you no no that's that's terrific so we're now going to turn to professor joanna michlik so this relates to the second piece of research that the foundation for jewish heritage undertook which was to consider the the educational potential of jewish cemeteries so i'm now going to hand over to joanna to give us a review of the assignment and what she discovered um. Michael, thank you very much you uh, for this kind introduction. I just had a crash of my computer, so Sophie has kindly agreed to help me with my PowerPoint uh, presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Sophie. And uh, just to say, uh, as a matter of introduction, I will be actually focusing on some of the aims, objectives, and some of the recommendations that I uh, prepared, uh, wrote, uh, wrote for the report. Very recently, I presented some part of this report in the summer workshop, summer school, Europass, about the importance of public history. And I was arguing that uh, Jewish cemeteries as an on-site lesson is, uh, uh, are also important aspects of public histories because they engage different stakeholders. Teachers are one group of stakeholders, but students are also another group of stakeholders, as this was also mentioned earlier today. So if we can move to slide number two, to, Sophie, do you actually, do, are you running the slideshow? Yeah, yeah, so we can see Perfect. it, Joanna. We can see slide number yeah, two. That's wonderful. So we all recognize that uh, Jewish cemeteries offer a great opportunity for learning. There is so much to be learned from them. That's the motto I interviewed for the report, Barbara Kirsch and Blad Gimlet, and that her words became the motto for the cemeteries. If we can now move to the next slide. Uh, some of the colleagues that I have interviewed, I interviewed, uh, first of all, teachers, and I wanted to thank my colleague from Central Europa for their work in making sure that uh, I have interviews, uh, enough interviews. I have interviews also teachers and uh, members of non-educators in non-formal uh, 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 education, as well as various academics. So uh, some of the academics that I have interviewed, they actually emphasize how important for them is to take their students, college students, university students, to the Jewish cemeteries in Europe. That's the highlight in the yearly 
teaching because only then the student actually grasp through being at the Jewish cemeteries and other parts of the Jewish heritage, the real meaning of that heritage. And of course, some of the professors in Hungary, historians working at the universities in Hungary, Poland, that I interviewed, they were very keen on developing special units um, uh, um, teaching about the Jewish cemeteries, the, about the history of Jewish cemeteries, about the people uh, who were buried in the cemeteries, about the different fields, subjects that the cemeteries can teach us about. So uh, uh, that's important to keep in mind because actually there is a group of individuals, uh, scholars and non uh, in educators in form, involved in informal education who have a great deal to offer and they are very keen on contributing to uh, expanding uh, the development of education through the Jewish cemeteries. So when it comes to my uh, to this report, and I can ask you now, Sophie, for the next slide, slide number four. So my, my, the key aims of this report was to examine the state of high school education uh, in addressing Jewish heritage and the Holocaust in seven countries of the post-communist Europe. And I focus on the areas, what has been done, what is not being done, what are the challenges, what are the limitations, and as you can imagine, the voices of the teachers involved in high school educations uh, have been in the heart of my reports. They have focused, uh, uh, I have focused on them and in this report to me, they, uh, their voices are the, those that they matter because they actually are involved in, uh, in uh, teaching about Jewish heritage and they actually learn through their environment, working in particular environment about the uh, limitations and challenges. And they can tell us also at what state their uh, education about Jewish heritage and the Holocaust uh, is in their own communities, uh, in their local communities. Another aspect of my report actually was to provide recommendations for potential further development of systematic and rich educational curricula incorporating Jewish cemeteries. And we have already heard uh, about many interesting projects in, um, such as podcasts with young uh, students and filmmaking. Uh, these aspects were also part of my report. This has been reported in, by many teachers that students are very keen on developing uh, new ideas and use new technology to learn about different aspects of Jewish history, Jewish uh, social life, cultural life, as well as about the Holocaust using this new digital technology. But I have also, as you will see in a moment, I have also prepared some possible topics for further development uh, when it comes to education through Jewish cemeteries. But before that, let me move to the objectives. Sophie, can I have your next slide? So. Uh, I, uh, the report focuses on particular periods, so I deal with the engagement with the rich pre-1939 Jewish heritage and the Holocaust in high school education, and what is very important for me is to see the cemeteries, the incorporations of the size of Jewish cemeteries into high school curricula, as a way of empowering local actors to preserve the Jewish cemeteries. And of course, when we talk about the engagement of young people in learning in Jewish cemeteries, we are talking about two spheres, the intellectual, the cognitive sphere, but also the empathic sphere of education. And of course, these two spheres 
combine actually have a long lasting effect. That's the underlying assumption. Uh, and of course, in turn, this type of edu education actually will strengthen civil, pluralistic and democratic societies throughout the region. And among some of the uh, proposed educational projects by me, uh, if we can move now to the next slide. Sophie, can I have the slide number six? that uh, I thought that uh, might be worth of developing with different organizations, different stakeholders are certain areas. So one of them are the cemeteries can be a powerful resource to study mutual influences of cultures, Jewish and non-Jewish cultures. If you look at some of the, the appearance of images in Jewish cemeteries, how did this happen? Yes, the influence of, for example, of the Soviet culture, non-Jewish Soviet culture on the cemeteries in Lithuania, uh, in Georgia. That's one of the aspects that could be actually uh, developed in, uh, into full lessons, models for lessons. Another aspect is studying the space of a cemetery as a reflection of cultural and social change within the Jewish communities. So we are talking about the encounter of Jews with modernity, Bundist traditions, Zionist traditions, um, the burial of Shimon Ansky, for example, uh, uh, is a model for teaching about the social and cultural changes within the Jewish community before the Second World War. Another aspect, of course, is the development, studying the place of the cemetery and death in Jewish folklore. Another one would be studying and conducting first-hand research about migrations of Jewish refugees during and in the aftermath of the Holocaust. And of course, here, Georgia is the country with the great actually potential here uh, to develop uh, such lessons, tracing through the Jewish cemeteries, the various groups of refugees from Poland, uh, who came uh, during the Second World War to Georgia. Uh, that's a fantastic way of learning about migrants, refugees uh, among us. Another area that I would uh, see as an imp very important one to develop is studying the Jewish cemetery as marker of collective memory, early post-Holocaust commemoration, private and communal, and of course, studying the Jewish cemetery in the history of the Holocaust. I have learned from many teachers that uh, in uh, Poland, Slovakia, Lithuania, that they, for example, use the Jewish cemetery to study about the size of per perpetration. However, there is less uh, lessons about studying the Jewish cemetery as a site of survival, uh, as a site where uh, Jews uh, uh, hid food, where they were hiding, also young ones, and some Jewish families were hiding together. This is all very important aspects of Jewish history, history of the Holocaust that has only recently been uncovered. And we have to in incorporate now this new cutting edge historical research into the educational system, into the educational curriculum. So of course, um, if, we, if we can now move to slide, the slide number seven, uh, many of the colleagues that I have interviewed, scholars have recognized the great potential of Jewish uh, cemeteries in demystifying the subjects of the Jews, uh, uh, familiarizing students young, students of high schools and also students of colleges, local uh, colleges, 
about uh, who Jews are, because uh, uh, given also the other aspects of what's going on in post-communist Europe today and various reports, we know for sure that Jews are still to some degree uh, the other in the local communities. So that's very important that the Jews will become viewed once again as part of their uh, communities, as co-citizens, uh, a, a topic that I think is one of the key challenges for educators. If we move to the slide eight, we actually, from my report, you will see that many of the educators and teachers involved, they recognize the challenges uh, 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 when it comes to education about Jewish cemeteries, but also they recognize the great potentials of the Jewish cemeteries. And here, I want to give you one quote from a teacher from high school in Moldova. The local Jewish cemetery can become visible and a real starting point to study Jewish heritage, to do research and to design curricular and extracurricular projects of social significance. Also, the cemetery can be seen as an open air museum that can provide a huge amount of information and data. Now, let me move now to some of the key recommendations. I'm not going to focus on all of the recommendations. You can find them in the report. One of the, uh, can we now move to slide number nine? Yes, One I don't want to interrupt you too much, but just so you know, um, we are running over time now because we only gave you 15 minutes. So we will have to unfortunately- Sure, sure. I, I'm going uh, to finish in a moment, okay. but let me focus on, couple of the recommendations. So proper integration of the subject into curricula. This is very important. Uh, and of course, what I found out in this report is that there is actually a lack of integration perceptions of the Jewish history and Jewish heritage and the Holocaust as histories that belong to us. They are the histories of the others. So even in the case of the Holocaust, what we see is that this is the history of the Nazis who killed the Jews, and this is and this is persistent in spite of the fact that the Holocaust education has been taught and being integrated into the system from the late 1990s. We still have these huge gaps. And of course, I cannot share with you uh, some of the statements of the teachers who actually clearly recognize that. But if we go to slide number 10 and slide number 11, uh, that's obvious. For example, in the slide uh, number sorry, 11. I'm really sorry to cut in, but we are we really. Um, yes, but Sophie, let me finish. Okay. Yeah. So in the slide number tw uh, 11, uh, uh, a uh, an educator from Hungary actually talks uh, about the situation that the 2020 change in the national curriculum didn't touch this contents and the whole approach is very nationalistic. So the Jews are still treated as the alpha. And of course, the final point that I want to make is that the local history framework is has been recognized by most of the teachers as an important one. So the focus should be on local history and the development of particular curricula on teaching difficult and contested histories pertaining to the Holocaust and antisemitism. And another aspect that uh, is very important one is the recommendation for continuation of, uh, of training for teachers by the uh, local non-governmental NGOs, as well as international Jewish NGOs, such as Centropa. All teachers who were interviewed, they wanted continuity of workshops, uh, uh, and they actually also indicated 
uh, that there is a lack of pre-service training for teachers. And of course, one of the key problem that emerged from my report is that we are dealing with the teachers who have been interviewed, they are the enthusiastic group of teachers, but we have to think about how to expand that pool of this enthusiastic proactive teachers who have actually very often paid from their own pocket for various resources uh, to provide uh, their students in classroom. I will finish here. Okay, thank you so much. And and you know, if I can just re reassure everyone that 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 the reports that you're hearing about are available on the the Jewish Cemeteries website, so you'll be able to 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 fully explore the results of Joanna's research and indeed the result of Paul's research on visitor destinations. And you can read through it and you'll read all the recommendations. So this was a a taster of of what the um, the reports produced. Uh, there was a third report, and we're now going to turn to, to the deep dive. Um, Dr. Rachel Lichtenstein is the project officer of the Foundation for Jewish Heritage, and her assignment was to organise the deep dive project, which involved developing a range of creative, cultural and educational activities in one significant cemetery in each of the seven countries. Rachel sadly could not join us today, but here is her recorded presentation. Sophie, over to you. Hello, my name is Rachel Lichtenstein. I'm a British author and academic who's worked as the project officer for the Foundation for Jewish Heritage to steer a range of different creative and educational activities at seven different Jewish cemeteries across Europe for the Deep Dive program. The purpose was to explore a variety of cemeteries as pilot projects that test out educational and touristic activities at these sites to encourage visitors from local communities and school groups and those from abroad to visit and learn more about these places in engaging new ways. Some of these sites are well known. Others are satellite burial grounds chosen for their ecological or historic value or due to the partnerships with local teachers or communities already developed in those places. All of these cemeteries are filled with stories about Jewish European settlement and life. And as this project demonstrates, we can learn a great deal from engaging with them. In this brief presentation, I will give a summarized overview of each project in the seven different countries, which use different models and ways of exploring these sites. We've tested a range of different initiatives in these seven different countries, which you can see on the map here. Exploring the potential of these sites for interpretation, local community engagement, to develop heritage skills, and for general educational, cultural, artistic, and touristic purposes. The full details of the many partners, participants and institutions who participated in these seven projects is available in the detailed deep dive report on the project uh, website. I'd like to start by talking about the deep dive in Georgia, where we developed a teacher's pack that explores, explores Georgian Jewish history and Jewish cemeteries in the country, which are uniquely different to other burial grounds across Europe. The Deep Dive program offered a unique opportunity in Georgia to develop this project in collaboration with historical experts, designers, educators, and the Jewish community. The project developed out of an urgent need. There's been a gap in available material for secondary school groups on Jewish cemeteries in Georgia, and most school teachers have limited knowledge on Jewish history. The development of this pack bridged this gap by creating a freely downloadable resource that enables pupils and teachers to explore and learn about Jewish cemeteries, and in turn, Jewish culture and life through the activities and information in the pack. 
The pack is now available in Georgian and English from the project website. Furthermore, it's been printed out and sent to many schools in Georgia and distributed to libraries. The pack is richly illustrated with relevant photographs and drawings, includes historical information, activities such as drawing symbols from tombstones, and personal stories of Georgian Jewish figures, as well as a quiz at the end for students to test their knowledge. For Hungary, we developed a project that cemented already established local Jewish and non-Jewish partners in the city of Sambathli, who have been actively engaged in preserving Jewish memory there. The city was chosen for this project because of its rich Jewish history, still active community and successful Jewish heritage projects conducted by an active non-Jewish school teacher there and the head of the Jewish community, Judith Sugar, who directed and wrote the film. The documentary film of about 15 minutes focuses on the cemetery. It captured stories of many important personalities buried there and how the care of the graves today is an important task for the community who remain and for local school children. The film was produced by the local television company and is of an extremely high quality. Please do watch it. The film also features uh, drone footage of the town and cemetery, extensive archive material on the history of the community, interviews with the mayor alongside other local people. The documentary is in Hungarian with English subtitles. And the film successfully explores the fate of Hungarian and Central European Jewry through the history of just one town. In Lithuania, we worked in collaboration with a local institution, a Jewish historian and a writer to encourage school children to develop creative writing projects around their visits to a Jewish cemetery in Vilnius. This innovative project was developed in close cl collaboration with award-winning Lithuanian writer, Aneta Amra, and the Samueli Back Museum, a branch of the Vilna Gaon Museum of Jewish History in the capital of Vilnius. Local school children had tours with a guide to the Jewish cemetery followed by workshops with Aneta in both the museum and their local school. The objective was to learn about the history of the cemetery and the community, then develop creative responses in the form of stories and poems, which resulted in the publication of the students' work. Following workshops with the writer, the pupils developed these ideas into poems and pieces of writing in many forms, including fiction, non-fiction, short stories, and poetry. This was developed into a publication, which includes photographs of the workshops and cemetery visits. The book was launched at a special event in June. For Moldova, we produced a standalone audio walk of 10 to 12 minutes long, available in Romanian, English, and Russian, that explores the history and stories of individuals buried in the Jewish cemetery in Moldova's capital city. The project builds on the trans history audio walk on Jewish life of Chisniel, developed by Centropa and Megid, to create a more immersive visitor experience for those wishing to explore this extraordinary cemetery site and direct them to places of interest. This pilot project aims to demonstrate how such an audio guide can encourage visitors, tourists, school groups to explore a Jewish cemetery and how making such a tool freely available in three different languages might expand the tourist and visitor footfall of such a site. For Poland, we developed a collaborative photographic and history programme 
based in Krakow, to encourage new ways of engaging with two burial sites there. The innovative part of this interdisciplinary project involved local university students from the Jewish Studies Department who were trained in photographic and artistic techniques and encouraged to look at familiar places and explore well-known histories in new ways. The project was also developed in close collaboration with the Galicia Museum in Krakow and culminated in this launch of a photographic exhibition that examined both the history and the beauty of the cemetery at the High Synagogue in June 2023. In Slovakia, we developed a pack for primary school <coughs> children that explored the history, biodiversity and ecology of the old forgotten Jewish cemetery outside the city centre of, of Bas Baska Bistra. This site is historically rich, has a great range of plants, bird and insect life, making it perfect for this project. The content was researched and produced by master's students from the Department of Biology and Ecology at the local university. This project demonstrates how visits to Jewish cemeteries can provide an insight into both the historical past and the ecological and current concerns of communities today, as neglected rural sites, such as Jewish cemeteries, often become places of rich biodiversity. The focus of this project was around ideas of caring for our past and our future, and to combat the negative effects of climate change by protecting historic and ecologically important sites. Due to the ongoing war in Ukraine, an, an online outcome for this deep dive project was collectively decided to be the best option, as we were unable to conduct activities on the ground. Building on the incredible work of local historian Tatiana Fedorov of the town of Zabarovs in western Ukraine, we developed a digital memory map of the cemetery there, which visitors can remotely explore from anywhere in the world. This interactive digital map brings the stories of 15 individuals buried there vividly to life through a combination of historical research and photographic images. We use the digital platform Memory Mapper, developed by British researchers, including Dr. Duncan Hay of University College London and myself during the pandemic, to geolocate Tatiana's research and make it widely available to international scholars and other visitors to the, to the site. I would just like to end this short presentation by saying a huge thank you to everyone involved, to the EU for funding this important work, to our partners Centropa and ESJF, a particular thanks to the Centropa line managers and all the country coordinators whose local knowledge and expertise has made this ambi ambitious project possible in a year. And a huge thank you to Michael Mel, Dame Helen Hyde, and the Foundation for Jewish Heritage for allowing me to take part in this amazing project. The Deep Dive program brought so many different, brought together so many different kinds of people, institutions, and organizations, both Jewish and non-Jewish, across seven European countries, among them educators in all fields including students, school teachers, 
tour guides, historians, universities and lecturers, as well as museums, local community representatives and politicians. Many designers, photographers, artists, filmmakers, translators, sound recorders, actors and writers were engaged in the development stage. In total, approximately 500 individuals have taken part in the programme so far as participants, collaborators and partners. Many more are expected to engage with the multiple outcomes of this project, which includes, as you have seen, teachers' packs, audio walks, a documentary film, a digital mapping project, exhibitions and booklets. I'm sorry not to be with you today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and thank you very much. That's Bye great. all. Thank you, Rachel. And, um, you know, when we we're looking at this at the beginning, you know, there was two things that we wanted to see. We wanted to see variety of different types of activities to demonstrate, in a sense, how versatile cemeteries can be in terms of programming. And we also want to see innovation. We want to see creativity. And Rachel has done a wonderful job coordinating this, working with local people on the ground. Um, and uh, we're delighted with, with what was achieved in the different countries. I can tell you that her report is also available on the Cemeteries website, and we want these to serve as case studies, but also as models. We hope that they will be taken up and used as people think about how Jewish cemeteries could be engaged with in the future. We're now going to turn to uh, our panel discussion, which is entitled Antisemitism and Holocaust Denial, What the Cemeteries Teach Us All which I'll be chairing. The panel consists of, of Ed, Phil and Helen, whom you've met before. And we're going to be joined by His Excellency, the Ambassador of Israel to Moldova and Armenia, Joel Leon. So Joel, I hope you're there. Um, we do not have a lot of time for this. So I'm going to ask each of the consortium panelists to address the title of this session for up to five minutes and then ask the ambassador to respond with his thoughts and then we'll end with a, with, a, with a general discussion. So the question is, what can cemeteries teach us in terms of confronting anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial? So let me begin with Ed, over to you. Uh, you're on mute, Ed. Yeah. Sophie, I take it, Ed can, yeah, that's How about now? Yeah, you're okay, that's great. Excellent. Um... The, uh, there's an enormous field of study today and, and, and an enormous, almost we could say, industry on combating anti-Semitism. Uh, personally, I, I really don't know how some people do it uh, on an institutional level. You can pass laws, you can mandate things, but until you are down in the weeds, until you're working in a classroom or on a grassroots level, you're not really going to get anywhere. Uh, you can't tell people not to be anti-Semitic. Um, and as far as I know, anyone who's, has anybody actually ever cured an anti-Semite? I don't think so. What we do, as I had said before, is we need to uh, inoculate uh, future, uh, uh, future generations. And what we need to do is look at this as the long game. And we have to look, if it hasn't been working so far, then we have to put our best foot forward and find the, inst and find the instruments that create a multi-ethnic and multicultural view of every town and city of which Jewish life and Jewish heritage is part of it. What a great place to have, what a, what a great tool that we have with Jewish cemeteries. That is what Marla and Jay have done brilliantly in Rohatin. Uh, that is what other organizations, that's what Larissa is doing. Jewish heritage, has to be part of our worldview of ourselves, of our town, of our city. And when it is, we can, I, I believe that we can get somewhere. Once kids feel that the Jewish uh, uh, heritage of their town belongs to them, it doesn't make sense for them to look at Jews as the other. It's us. Um, we are proving that in one place after another. Larissa had done a, is doing an extremely good job of that. Thanks to Fabian and our team, and thanks to the uh, who we have on our right and our left, meaning uh, uh, the foundation with Michael uh, and Phil's organization on the other side. 
Cemeteries are something that we can use as a classroom. We are doing it. We have the data to prove that it, at least in the short term, it's having great, uh, um, uh, uh, great effect. We'll have to see how that tests out in the future. Um, so I think that's everything I need to say on the subject. Right. Okay. Okay. That's terrific. Okay. So Helen, can I please invite you to comment? Uh, you're on mute, Helen. Yep, that's it. Actually, Ed, I do agree with most of what you've said, and I agree with your passion. I'm a teacher, I'm an educator, and I spend a great deal of my time in the classroom, and I talk about Holocaust denial, the history of anti-Semitism, and distortion, and so on. Um, cemeteries and the now unused beautiful synagogues are the remnants of these um, communities, but I don't talk about them in this broader sense as you say, Holocaust education must adapt to each area, to each town, to each school, and to each circumstance that the students find before them. We've got a challenge of using these many sites and buildings to teach about the history and to educate young people, and particularly the future generations with real facts, real information that they can actually investigate themselves. I agree again with Ed that young people must become the investigators, the researchers, look for these places with teachers and Holocaust education facilitating the work they do. If they come across a beautiful remnant of a synagogue, let's say, the research must be undertaken by those students. But we the later generation, the older generation, needs to point them towards these beautiful buildings or this one single tombstone that remains, encouraging young people to develop these their own educational projects at the cemeteries and the synagogues will increase their knowledge and more importantly, their understanding of the important values of human dignity, democracy, respect for others, which is vital for the future and for their own personal future. If students aren't actually doing it themselves or we're doing it to the students, it will not work. The students must be active learners, active in the synagogues, active in the classrooms. And we must show them that attempts to delegitimize the facts um, are painful both to themselves, to their community, and to wider society. The challenge for us all in all our countries is to ensure that the curriculum is not only in the classroom, it's in the cemeteries, it's in the um, synagogues, and that educational establishments of all kinds encourage these types of projects that we heard about today um, in the cemeteries and the synagogues if we encourage them from top down and allow the students to do the work and to learn, but more importantly, to understand, we will have an impact for the future. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, that's great. Okay, over to you, Phil. You're on mute. <laughs> we all do that, it seems. <laughs> um, <laughs> haven't even learned through COVID of how to do that properly. Um, thanks, Michael. When you visit a Jewish cemetery, there are two questions which spring to mind. The first question that you ask if you see a Jewish cemetery in a tiny little village in Hungary is, who were these people? What was their contribution to, uh, to local life? How long were they there? And the second question that you ask is, why are they no longer there now? And when you see final gravestones in those cemeteries from 1942 or 1943, you understand exactly what happens. And then you start to trace back the history and the development of that anti-Semitism and that racism and that intolerance towards the Jew Jewish communities. And it brings to you directly in that village and to, and to, and to young people, the fact of the Holocaust. And for that reason alone, it is a major instrument of, against Holocaust and denial. I've worked for Jewish in, or organizations for many years now, and I've worked in the field of anti-Semitism and, and Holocaust and de denial. 
And what I would say is that we as Jews, we as international Jewish organizations, are very good with the macro education about of the Holocaust. We're good with the six million. We're good with one million kids who went to Auschwitz. We're good at that sort of level. But when you understand, for example, that there are 1,700 Jewish communities in Ukraine alone, which, which were impacted by the Holocaust. And in most of those places, the cemetery or the remnants of that cemetery are the last physical witness of those Jews. You understand the importance of maintaining that site as a direct history of, of the Jews. But I wanna say one other thing, which we don't often think, think about. Many Jews left these regions between 1880 and the start of the First World War. They left because of pogroms. Most of the people around here, the people from Western Europe, know about that because their descendants generally went to Britain or to South Africa or to, or to the United States or to Israel as a result of that. They were chased out by pogroms and by anti-Semitism. And many of those communities don't exist anymore. But when you trace the history of these cemeteries and you write them down and you understand that in a place as tiny as Transcarpathia, which is about to the size of Greater London, there were 275 individual Jewish communities. And most of those were destroyed within three months of the Hungarian Holocaust in 1944. You understand it on a direct level, and it prevents de denial. That's what, what we're trying to educate to. We're trying to bring the cemetery education, the Jewish presence education, and therefore you cannot deny the results of anti-Semitism or the results of the Shoah. Well, thank you for that, Phil. And you know, you reminded me that you know, the huge part of this is it's where the history happened. It's the place, you know, you're not reading a book from afar. You're, you're in the place where it happened. I think has, that has a huge power. And also, Phil, I was wondering whether you're going to touch on the issue, issue which we might get to after we hear from the ambassador, which is this whole thing of contested histories and the kind of, um, you know, how we I, handle with the co competing narratives and that aspect of it in dealing with the, the issue. Do you, do I want you want to say, give a quick response now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I want to say something that that's a very good question. I want to relate something to, to the education projects on that. If you'd asked me when I was much younger, at 17 or 18, whether I would take part in an education project based around the cemetery, any cemetery, Jewish or, or, or otherwise, I would have thought that that was impossible. When you, if you were to ask somebody in Ukraine in the middle of a war, non-Jewish, who's never encountered Jews, whether they want to be involved in that, you understand the depth of commitment and the depth of, of education that, that is going into, into these projects. We are creating a new generation of people supported by the European Union who cannot be anti-Semites after they've seen that. And that's a tremendous contribution to what we're doing in terms of Holocaust of denial and against anti-Semitism. And when Ukrainians can understand and empathize with Jews, not, in a, not in, a, in a conflictual way, but in a cooperative manner, in the most terrible conditions, and we hear from Ed about uh, Zaporizhia and places like that, We've been constructing fences with the cooperation of local mayors in the middle of a war. Now, I can't think of a better way to bring people together. I remember the chief rabbi of Poland once said to me, you're not building fences, you're building bridges. And that's what we're doing with this project. That's a lovely, lovely sentiment. So let me now turn to, to our ambassador, Leon. Um, so we'd be interested to get your response to, to what you've heard so far. And if I can ask you, please, to also say something about the issue of awareness campaigns at the governmental level, if you could also please address that as well. So over to you, Ambassador Leon. Thank you very much. And uh, hi to everyone. I, 
I know a lot of you and uh, we work together. We did the uh, great thing, we did uh, smaller things. But uh, the, the best thing I think is that uh, it's to tell you a story uh, about exactly what you said. And it, it, I think it, it makes uh, uh, the things uh, always uh, clearer when it's an anecdote. So uh, I went to this uh, village in uh, Western Ukraine called Varish, who is the, uh, it's the place where the family of my wife went to uh, Brazil uh, at, uh, I mean, it was just before the communists came in, just uh, after uh, First World War. And um, I'm asking the guy there in the streets, the guy was 60, 65, I would say, uh, where's the Jewish uh, cemetery? Okay, I know, I, I spoke to him in Russian, so maybe he was offended, I don't know. And uh, he told me, no, there, there is no Jewish cemetery here. Um, I say, no, there, there should be a Jewish cemetery here. He said, no, the Jews were only in Bells. Bells is, uh, what, 15, 20 minutes from there, uh, south, uh, at the family of my wife, uh, Bells are Hasidim. So, uh, so he says, no, there were only Jews in Bells. I said, no, I know that there were Jews here. I mean, uh, we, we know it for 100% for sure. So uh, we tried to go around and uh, I found some place uh, which could be something with a, with a gate, a ro uh, I, I mean, full of rust, et, et cetera. So I called up Philip, I sent him uh, the pictures. I told him, uh, Philip, I, I'm pretty sure that's the cemetery, but there is nothing, nothing, nothing left there. Uh, the people, uh, the people from the uh, from the foundation I see here, you'll see, uh, you'll see Bailin also here with us. Uh, so they, they they went to the archives, they checked, they saw the the, the cemetery uh, from the Austro-Hungarians maps, and, and they came and fenced it. And and there is also a hill there. The hill nobody knew, knew what's the hill. At the end, we knew what's the hill. The hill was the place where the uh, the Jews who uh, state uh, at the place in 41 were killed. So, and, and from this on, this village knows that there were Jews living there. And uh, everything that you said, that the, the, the uh, Jewish heritage is a part of the city, uh, Professor Serota or, or, or Dame Helen said, the young people become the teachers. Exactly, that's the point. And, um, and, and that's the way that, that people will, will understand and will connect to the Jewish history because the moment that you understand the Jews are a part of the place and not something foreign. The Jews are not foreigners. The Jews are a part of the place, built the place, then you will have the possibility to, uh, to, 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 to combat uh, anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. Now about the awareness uh, campaign. We are talking a lot about the young generation and it's important and it's the most important thing to do. But we have to think that when the young guy is coming home, he's still hearing from his parents the same uh, bad jokes about Jews. Or in the language, there is still the word uh, Jewish price or things like that, that uh, gives the stereotypes and uh, life goes on. I mean that the the, the, the important thing would be to find a way also to educate on the level of governments. Because when you come, and when I'm getting a phone call from uh, Rabbi Shapira uh, telling me that uh, somebody is doing something very bad in a cemetery somewhere in uh, Eastern Europe, and I have to go and to talk to a minister, and the minister even do not understand and understand what is so important in a Jewish cemetery. What is this, is this thing? You have to explain everything. So I think that to, to put somewhere and to have a way to explain what is the importance of Jewish cemetery to this kind of people on this level, on the governmental level, would be very helpful. I hope that I was in time. No, that was terrific. Thank you so much. That was great. So we're not just going to have a a general discussion for a few minutes and I, I'm going to take the cheers privilege of kicking, kicking this off and um, so you, uh, do you know Professor Mike Turner who lives in, in Jerusalem uh, so Mike, Mike's one of his famous quotes was you know we learn how the Greeks lived and how the Romans lived and how the Jews died and you know we have this this balancing act of talking about you know the Holocaust and anti-Semitism this huge dark trauma but we know we also want to talk about how 
how the Jews lived. And we don't want, you know, before the Holocaust. And so we, it's, a, it's a kind of balancing act of how, how do we, you know, how do we also project the positives? Because as we know, you know, the Holocaust is obviously a terrible, is a terrible, dark, dark story. And people respond in different ways to the story of the Holocaust. Um, so how, how do we how do we walk that line? May I tell you Making in one sure word? We address the Holocaust, but we also talk about, we also celebrate the Jews who were living there and the lives they led. May I tell, may I tell you it in one word? Sure. Israel. <laughs> Are you paid to do that? <laughs> <laughs> you see, if you talk about the, uh, the good things of Israel, about the miracle of Israel, about the startup nation, about uh, what Israel is doing in the world, what Israel, the good sides of Israel, the sides who unite us as a Jewish people uh, around Israel. And I think that we can find them. And to talk about them, people understand that Jews are not what they think. And then you go back to the history and, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay. And it's a contemporary story. So remind people the Jewish people, they're still here, they're thriving, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I hear you. Okay, I'm now going to open up. Would any of our panelists, anyone, Ed, Phil, Helen, do you want to comment on what you've heard from some of the other pan panelists? Ask any quick questions. I would just like to say one thing, Mark. Um, certainly in, in parts of Europe, when you mention Israel, in student environments, it's extremely difficult because they immediately revert to uh, the political situation. Okay, okay. Ed, you want to say something? Uh, just a, a couple of things. Is um, uh, my uh, uh, Centropa works in a lot of countries, most of them in Central and Eastern Europe. We love working in all of them, but we don't love working in any of them half as much as we do in Ukraine. <laughs> Years ago, I remember uh, Philip Roth, the novelist, was sitting with Ivan Klima in a park in Prague. This is in the 80s during the communist period. And Roth was listening to Klima and he blurted out, you know, in the West, everything is allowed and nothing counts. But here, nothing is allowed and everything counts. And it's like that when, when, when working in Ukraine, it's like that with working on Jewish heritage in Ukraine. And in regards to Israel, yes, you have a lot of Ukrainians who are justifiably, in my opinion, angry that Israel is not sharing the weapons that, it, uh, that they would like it to. On the other hand, ask many Israelis, uh, Ukrainians, where they want to be in five years. And they'll say, we want to be a, a, a big Israel. We want uh, a, a military development and we want IT. And that's something. Um, and by the way, our institute now is working on a, a, a database for oral histories for Ukrainians and who is uh, developing it? Uh, young guys in their 20s from Israel and Ukraine. And of course they met in a chat group on Finnish death metal. So I'd say there's, there's, uh, there's strong hope for all of us. Uh, and I want to thank everyone. Yes. Uh, Phil. Yeah. I think that we are at a particular time in history, 80 years after the Holocaust. Most of the survivors have sadly now passed. And within a few short years, there will be no other Holocaust survivors. So we have the challenge of transferring a mem memory into history. And history is about learning lessons. Yesterday, there was a far-right mayor elected in Germany to run a town for the first time since World War II. And these are phenomenon that occur when people forget the process which led to, to, to the destruction of Jews in the Holocaust. It wasn't something that just began in 1942. It didn't even begin in 1933. It's a process that takes place. And we need to re-educate pe people because the direct memory of seeing those Holocaust the survivors is not there. That's a massive challenge to sort of transfer the memory of three generations and to write history and to make sure it stays there. And you need those kind of physical uh, reminders in each of those towns and, vill and villages that that's what happens with hate and discrimination, anti-Semitism, racism, intolerance, all those things. 
And that's the challenge that we face today. And I want to say one thing which is very, very important here within this context. The European Union, with all its problems and other sorts of issues, and I know we've had them in Britain and whatever, remains a sort of light at the end of, of the tunnel for people in Eastern Europe. They, the fact that the European Union is involved in this project and seen to be involved in this pro project is a direct encouragement, we see it all the time, to people in Ukraine, in Moldova, in places which don't have the luxuries, if you like, of life in Western Europe. And one of those things that Western Europe has always been a guiding beat, beat, beat beacon of, particularly since the Holocaust, is those kind of things like democracy, human rights, tolerance, anti-racism, and those issues. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Phil. Pastor Leon, do you have any uh, any further comments that you'd like to make? No, I think that um, I can only um, comment the work that uh, all your organizations are doing. Your organization also, Michael, I know what you are doing. Uh, I know less the uh, other uh, organizations like Centropa. I don't know them very well, but I know that somebody, anybody, who is engaging himself to do good for the Jewish people should be commended. Oh, thank you, thank you. Oh, well, I think that's a, that's a good note to end our uh, panel discussion. Um, so we're, we are now, uh, we've now got a sp very special guest who is here. Uh, we're delighted and honored to have with us Georg Hausler, the Director for Culture, creativity and sport at the European Commission, who's also been very interested and a big supporter of this project. And he will now give the concluding address. So Georg, over to you. Michael, thanks for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, I've spent a fascinating afternoon here listening to, to all this. Uh, I have to say, uh, uh, you were one of the first ones to see me when I took over my new responsibility, you, Michael. Uh, and um, I, hope I, I hope I gave you good advice. You, I, I hope so. <laughs> uh, and, and obviously, you see Violin and uh, Phil Carmel, who also came to see me. And and I, you remember my first reaction when we, you know, you said, I think I had a bit of a similar first reaction as some others had and, and mentioned this afternoon, like cemeteries and, you know, thinking about this as a, as a tool to, to educate people and as a tool also to, to make sure that the past is not forgotten uh, is, is an intriguing, very interesting idea. Now, uh, I, I have a few thoughts about what I heard and listened to this afternoon, and, and, and if, if you, if you allow, I would want to share them with you. Now, uh, the first thing, I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed by what you've done in these 18 months, huh? because you, you gave me a little bit of the tip of the iceberg when we were talking, but now this afternoon I have seen all the different facets of this project. Uh, and I shall say, I'm, I'm extremely proud that, you know, we co-financed and we partly supported this, that, what we supported and what's the outcome of this. This is, this is incredible. I mean, this is huge results and, and, and really very deep work and, and, and very interesting work. Now, I, I, do, I do like this kind of philosophy you have behind it. Uh, use local people uh, and make it a life with local people because that's the only way it can work, not just come from the outside and, 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 and pull something over uh, from from the outside, but work with the local peoples. I think that's that's great. Uh, I also loved uh, what uh, uh, everybody I think said in his or her interventions, which was use. I particularly liked. Uh, I think it was Ed Sarota using the term. You have to turn young people into stakeholders. I like this idea, and I think that's that's actually the essence of of it. It's it's not about. Uh, uh, it's not about educating uh, the old people, but it's about educating the new generation who has no direct knowledge anymore, certainly of the Holocaust, but also of 
even the fact, uh, as so many of you mentioned, that people didn't even know that in their communities there was a, a large Jewish population, or indeed it was a Jewish population only there before, before the, uh, the atrocities of the Holocaust. Um, I, I like your, the philosophy behind it as well is you need to preserve the past to shape the future. Somebody of you said that this afternoon. I, th I think that's a very beautiful uh, say, thought and, and, and a beautiful way of, of uh, expressing it. And actually, that's a little bit what we are here doing with our whole cultural heritage approach. Uh, you need to make sure that people know about the cultural heritage of, uh, of this continent. Uh, and only then they will be able to be positive in the future. Now, I, I, I'm really impressed by the, I think the point some of you made, which is, uh, it's not about Jewish history in Eastern Europe. It's about European history. And to make clear that there is no distinction, there is on one side European history and the other side there's Jewish history. No, there's only one European history. And this is part of the European history. And particularly in Eastern Europe, it's pro but arguably the, the, the most important part of it. Yeah. Uh, and to bring this knowledge back into the minds, but also into the stomachs of people, that people actually understand that they are actually a product to a certain extent of this culture, uh, which, which has been shaped for centuries, uh, the cultural life of, of, of Europe. Um, now, I, I was interested to hear this. I think it started more positively in some of the interventions, but uh, then particularly, I think, uh, Dr. Darby in his, there is a certain risk of ignorance. People don't know about it, so there is no risk for anti-Semitism. I think the Georgian example from Theona. Uh, and uh, Dr. Darby, who said there is also risk of denial. And I think we, we need to be aware of this. I mean, this it's not it's not a given. Huh? Uh, I, I'm not sure whether what's the right answer to this, uh, because some make it very easy. And you remember we had a discussion about my own uh, about my own home when I told you that you know people wouldn't know very much about the history of where I come from. That there was a large Jewish population and has completely disappeared. And and I am a little bit pessimistic towards my own uh, people that. You know there is this part of denial, which is a, you know, a active negative act. Denial is something different compared to ignorance, where people, if they don't know, okay, you can't blame them. But it, it's it's not wanting to know, which is probably, uh, which is probably out there. Uh, I also uh, think it's extremely important uh, what in one. Uh, intervention was made clear that you need to create local structures in order to keep this alive. It shouldn't be just this 18 months project or the project which is going to continue. It in order to make it living so that cemeteries are not after 10 years forgotten again, there needs to be a local tissue, a local infrastructure, a local interest of arguably most of the time a non-Jewish population because it just simply doesn't exist anymore. Uh, to keep uh, these cemeteries alive as memorial parts of 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 our of our uh, countries. Uh, interesting to hear from from Vito these all these legal considerations. I I, I I was actually quite proud to hear that Europe is a beacon of positive law setting in this. Uh, in this context, and the European Union has a very positive impact on the legal system, on the local legal systems, to make sure that actually the cemeteries can be brought back to its original um, destination. Uh, I was also interested by one of the debates um, in 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 one study. I think it was also Dr. Darby who said that there were people saying it should be, the cemetery should be only for pilgrims, basically the religious part of it. Yeah. Interesting, by the way, when uh, UC Berlin said in the beginning, when they started the project, thinking about the cemeteries that he didn't know whether it was more cultural or more religious. Uh, now, now here, 
I fully agree to what Dr. Tavi said. Don't you know this shouldn't be just for for for, for Jewish people and their memory. It should it it, it has to be for all of us. Huh? Because then only then it will actually do its purpose. I like obviously also the very pragmatic approach to tourism that this can and should become a part of a touristic uh, interest of a certain region and why not uh, be part of a, a discovery tour of a certain region to to also have um, uh, cemeteries on 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 the map. Uh, Interesting and good that uh, you also used a lot of new technology. I've seen this other example of the drones, uh, the digitalization of the cemeteries, which is partly a project I think we also co-finance. Uh, I think that's the way to do it. And obviously the, the, what, what many of you said that the young people, they have their own ideas how to do and how to make memory uh, a life uh, innovation which should come from young people and why not uh, enter this. Uh, thanks to everybody uh, who, who praised uh, the European uh, Union and the Commission in this context. Uh, I think you all did and, and, and thanks for that uh, because uh, it's, it's good you know, to be doing good things but it's also good that people acknowledge it that uh, the Commission has put this very high on its agenda. And, and my colleague, Katharina von Schnurbein, who is, who is really only there for that, uh, I think shows the determination also on a political level from the institution, uh, how important this is to us. But obviously we uh, also with our program, Creative Europe, uh, are, are, are happy and proud to, to be able to uh, help you also financially. So nothing else but say congratulations. This is really truly impressive what you have uh, produced with all your partners in the last 18 months. And, and I hope this work can and will continue and I hope we can and will continue to support it. Thanks a lot. This was a really fascinating afternoon. Thanks a lot for that. No, well, thank you. And thank you, Georg, for taking, taking the time to join us and spend, spend this time with us. I mean, we are hugely grateful uh, to the EU, to the European Commission, for the support that's been given here, and you know, and beyond the financial support, you know, the the, the fact that that the profile of this this issue uh, has has been raised, you know, across the European Union has been hugely helpful, and it's enabled us to to talk to national governments, regional governments, local governments, with uh, with with in a more emphatic way, knowing that we have the EU behind us. So it's been hugely important. And as I say, we, we're hugely grateful to you and your colleagues for, for everything that you have done and are doing to support to support this agenda. And I will say, you know, you, you use that term, but, you know, not not just being for Jews, Jewish heritage, not just being for Jews. And, you know, one of the terms we use is this is shared heritage. Yes, it's Jewish heritage, but it's Polish heritage. It's European heritage. This is shared heritage. Okay. Okay. So I'm now, uh, we're now coming to the end. And um, by the way, I, I saw, is it, is it Eon? I don't know if you've been looking at the, the photographs that are here, but I noticed that Eon in Moldova, he's got this tube train that comes in. I don't know if you could all see that on his picture. <laughs> so so for, for this afternoon, I've been watching this tube. There you are. Eon. I've been watching this tube arriving the train arriving into the station all afternoon I was just waiting what was going to happen next but <laughs> and we thank you for that so um in terms of you know now kind of concluding clearly um I mean I hope you all agree that we've had a, a very you know wide-ranging and fascinating afternoon as we've been looking at all the various facets of this project across seven countries addressing a whole range of of, of subject matter, you know, education, the legal aspect, competitions, visitor destinations, tourism. Uh, I mean, it's and it's it's been it's been. I mean, I've I've found it just to see it all laid out in one afternoon. I think we've all found it quite, quite, quite incredible, really. What what has been achieved over these these eighteen months? And of course, there's a a lot to absorb. And um, as I mentioned at the at the beginning of the event, that we we you know we would welcome your questions and comments, and Sophie will be writing to you all, uh, giving you information as to how you can send that through to us, and we'd be very happy to answer 
any 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 issues that you want to raise, we can give our, our perspective and and give feedback on that. So um, in concluding, on behalf of the consortium, firstly, we, again, we want to thank the European Union and European Commission for initiating and backing this very special project across its three iterations. This is actually the third round of funding. And I think with each round, you know, we've got bigger and bolder in terms of our ambition of what we want to achieve. Uh, and it's been, a, a, speaking personally, very exciting to be part of this. Huge thanks to everyone who's been associated in delivering the project, especially the impressive professional teams that came together for this from our own Foundation for Jewish Heritage, from the European Jewish Cemeteries Initiative and Centropa, and that includes crucially the country coordinators in each of the seven countries and the terrific line managers who oversaw the work in each of the countries and all the partner organizations and the incredible individuals who have been crucial to making the project the success it became, including those who've been tirelessly working in this area for many years, because to a certain extent, we're standing in the shoulders of giants. There are many activists out there. We heard about a number of them today who've been toiling in the fields, great champions of this agenda. But ho hopefully we have enhanced and in taking a kind of comprehensive view, we've, we've brought a special perspective which takes on this conversation further and it advances. That's, that's certainly our, our aspiration. This has been a very moving experience for all of us. And we have this clear message coming out of today, as echoed by Georg in his final remarks, which is this is work that must continue. And in continuing this work, we honour the memory of those lost communities. We ensure they're not forgotten. And we ensure that by bringing to the fore the once thriving Jewish life of Eastern Europe, we can help shape the values of the Europe of, the Europe of today. This is about the past, but it's about the present and it's about the future. So let me conclude by thanking all of you for joining us this afternoon. I hope you feel it's been worthwhile. And I wish you all a, a productive week ahead. So I will say goodbye. It's very nice seeing you. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>